Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Always Forward Podcast. Um, this one has been a long time coming, man. My good friend John Stevens. Welcome, dude. It's great to be here, man. Thanks for bringing me out. It's uh, it's kind of weird how things play out, right? Like, I called you the other day and was like, hey, man, it's actually good timing that you called. Yeah, we've been talking about it for a while. I was here, what, two years ago? Yeah. And then we talked about it at the beach, I remember, and then kind of things stalled out, things got busy, and yeah. then just miraculously just randomly called me. And Uni- universe is wild, man. Yeah. Yeah. So real quick, because everybody's going to want to know right out the bat, like he's got this big dude, he looks scary, you got a bunch of tattoos. Um, what What is your background? <laughs> <laughs> Are we starting from childbirth? No, that's, we don't have to go into the, we don't have to go to your criminal background. You do it starting when like you joined the Marine Corps and became, yeah. became yeah. a cop, sort of. Oh, half God, cop. Man, you, already, you already dropped that. <laughs> yeah. right, starting us off on a half, good Half start, cop. Starting off on a good note. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, grew up in Oakland, California. You guys are familiar with the Bay Area? I grew up in Castro Valley, California. Uh, I wrestled in college for a little bit. And then when I got done, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't want to grow up yet. I had a degree in criminal justice. I was thinking about becoming a cop, but I wasn't, maturity wise, probably wasn't the best bet for me. So, uh, and I ended up enlisting uh, out of California. <clears throat> and then I didn't know what I was doing at all. I had no. There's no one military in my family whatsoever. I didn't have any mentors. Like I usually make decisions. I don't ask anybody. I just thought oh, it sounds good. Boom, let's do it, you know, for your commitment. Um, so since I had the criminal justice background, I'm like, fine, we'll just go MP. I had no idea what that meant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I had no idea what that meant. So join a list. I get through boot camp. I get to MP school. And I'm like, this is not for me. This is not for me. The war is going on. Like not, Fallujah, Fallujah, not my speed. Fallujah yeah. just ended, you yeah. know, so you're getting all the vets coming in from that. And, you know, everyone's trying to get overseas. What year did you come in? Uh, 2005. 2005. So yeah, right. Like what flu was 2004 yeah. and then yeah, five. So surge, surge was in 2006. Yeah. So you hear all those stories up there and then the position I was in, I'm like, I'm never going to make it overseas. So then they had like a <laughs> psych. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So they had a, an option to go to, to dog handling course. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, I knew there was one chance because, uh, if I went to Camp Lejeune, they have a field dog handling course. So all I would yeah. do is attach the infantry and go out. Like that sounded a lot better. So I ended up getting selected. I went to dog handling school. Um, and then, End up deploying with uh, conventional infantry, work with a couple of conventional units. It was a kind of a mediocre deployment. And then with me, I always I get tired real quick, so then I want to move on to different things. Uh, Marsoc stood up after that, um, and then they need a dog handling program. So I ended up coming over with one other person, and we started that dog handling kennel from scratch, uh, which is kind of a cool process to see. Who'd from, you come over with? Uh, this guy, uh, Mark Killen's dad, and then me. So okay. it was a uh, yeah, senior dog handler that I came from uh, from conventional. I, I remember him, but I don't. Yeah, big, tall, bald guy, yeah, yeah. real deep voice. Yeah. Um, so he had all the background of setting up kennels. Like, he'd been doing it for a long time. He was a gunny at the time. <clears throat> so uh, we came over, and then, uh, yeah, we set up the kennels from scratch. We got Jake in there. Um, oh, Jake. Yeah, hold oh, Jake. Uh, was, have you talked to him recently? Uh, once in a while, I'll get, like, a text from him. He's still doing the same thing, living up in Indiana, training dogs. He hasn't, you know, doing the exact same him. thing. So, um, but, uh, so we got him over and then the first deployment we did was with your team. So that's how we met yeah. coming in there. Um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was incredible. Yeah. I do the first dog deployment with Marsoc and then, uh, we did that deployment, which is rough. I'd say that goes down probably one of the worst deployments ever just for boredom purposes. I would say so. <laughs> yeah. Another, another and other reasons and that we'll get into. We'll, yeah. Yeah. I'll probably <laughs> rush over. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, uh, so I got into to Marsoc because uh, I, the officer they had at the time, Art, he, uh, I was already kind of looking, thinking about like, I mean, like, some of these guys in the team, I could, I think I could probably run circles around these guys. Well, you could, and you yeah. did. <laughs> that was kind of interesting, is because like you, even though you were a dog handler, you weren't really a dog handler. Yeah, no, I was like you one were, of the guys. You were one of the guys. Time. Like you were probably out of everybody, because you know, there's always this weird. Initially, there's always this weird like us and them. Yeah. kind of thing initially until they kind of if they can if they can kind of what's the word integrate integrate yeah if they can integrate well um then they kind of do become part of the team but you were one of the first guys i've ever seen that just like you just snapped right in i yeah. don't know if it was obviously it was the right personality because you guys are what you did after yeah um but yeah you just you were just one of the guys on the team you just happened to have a dog <laughs> yeah. yeah no it was a good experience it's kind of like when i came in the military it wasn't what i thought it was going to be and then with my background with wrestling and having team sports and stuff, you know, you yeah. used to like like very high performing people. And most of the military is not high performing people until you get into some of these other units. Yeah. Like when I first got to you guys, I'm like, this this is where I want to be. Like this these is, are the people I want to be around. They're right. all like, yeah, like older guys. They're all professional. Way more competition. Yeah, way you're more not, competition. Because that, that was that with me 
that was that way for me as well. Like, you know, the regular Marine Corps, I was like one of the top guys. Yeah. But I'm like kind of lackluster a little <laughs> bit. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, this is, this is it. Yeah. And then when you pushed up to that level, it's like, well, now, now you're not one of the top guys. You're yeah. average and yeah. you got to fight to be better. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, so it's, that's what the kind of, for those of you that are listening, that's the kind of caliber, or if that's the environment that you want to be in. Well, yeah. It's just, it's harder because yeah. the bar is higher. Right. So yeah, I was thinking about it. I was kind of on the fence and then Art approached me he's just like, he's like, Hey man, you, same thing. He's like, you, you, you're hanging with these guys. You ever thought about going through selection? And that's like all I needed. Cause I was kind of like on the fence, but then once I got that like nudge from him, then that's all I did. Like I dropped everything. I uh, dropped a package. Like, I got started training and then went through selection. I got was it easier because you're already with our unit? No, because I got a lot of negative love because people knew really? me. Really? Yeah. So uh -huh. it's uh, if they any so it's not so much in selection, right? I don't want any names, but like you really got negative love. Uh, there, if I was, so I deserved it, right? But I, I had I had a very like close eye on me at any time. If I was caught slipping at all, I was directly like corrected on the spot. Or like I had, I had a different kind of a spotlight on me because people knew me and they took it personally. If I was, if I was lagging or I didn't meet standards or I, like when I got in the pool, cause I struggled in the pool a lot, yeah. people took him as like a, I deploy with you. This is a personal strike against me type deal. You know what I mean? Which yeah, I barely made it out of that you damn did, pool. You did struggle in the pool. Yeah. Remember that? Remember you swim yeah. at your house? Yeah. You know what I did after that? What? Went to the Y. Did you? I was learning how to swim with like eight year olds. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a lesson, right? You do whatever the hell you got to do to figure this out. I'm going to go train with eight-year-olds so I can pass the lecture. I've worked with you for, for like a little bit, and you're like, maybe you should take swim lessons. I'm like, I'm like <laughs> probably, probably told you to fuck off in my head. And then uh, I got home, and like, it's coming up. Maybe we should take swim lessons. And I'm in there with like tattooed up with like eight-year-olds next to me, and we're learning how to do crawl stroke or freestyle or whatever. Hey, you did it, so, man. Yeah, I ended up making it through. Um, did you ever go to dive school? No. Thank no, I God, did, I did two dive schools, but uh, I was already so banged up, and then and then I had everything that happened after that last deployment yeah. that that just snowballed, and like I just mentally wasn't there. So, oh, but, good, uh, yeah. So no dive school. Yeah. Better jumping out of airplanes than I am in the water. That's so. a fact. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot more fun too. Yeah, yeah. I was on a dive team for five years. That shit is miserable, bro. Yeah, water is fucking miserable. Yeah, I don't know why people want to do that because you got to swim in, do the op, then swim out. Well, and then you're like, yeah, and then you're, <laughs> you're trying right to. By the time you get there, you're trying to do the op, and and nobody's going to understand this. In the movies, they make it look super sexy, but like you're doing this, you're trying to put sensors on a dock or a boat or yeah. some bullshit, and then like you're all this air's coming, like you're, all, you're getting overinflated because you didn't, you know, you you might, you might have breathed down your bag enough, but yeah. then like now you're 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 breathing more, and it's all it's just yeah. you're trying to curate your your buoyancy and. It's just a shit show. Yeah, you show up water. and you forget about the five k. You just swam to get there. <laughs> yeah, and, and you, gotta, to, you had to swim five k to get to the starting point. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not so sexy in real life. Uh, it, it looks real sexy on on um, on the in the movies, but, but but so does everything, right? Patrolling in the woods on nods at night always is so sexy in the movies, but yeah. in real life, it's like <laughs> yeah, briars and you're stepping it's a, on stuff it's a and the shit bugs show. are biting you and you're yeah. just pissed the entire time. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, so you you got your shot at selection. Yep. Um, how did you do a selection? Good. Yeah. I, uh, so I, I failed hard the first couple of days of land nav. Right. Yeah. I knew I was going to struggle in land nav because I, I knew I wasn't very good at it. Um, <clears throat> I missed majority of my points the first couple of days. Yeah. Um, I didn't make time to like the second and third day, so I figured at this point, like I'm 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 on the I'm on the edge, right? Even though I had history with with the guys and stuff like that, I mean they got to hold the standard, right? Yeah. So the day five, I got my shit together. I kind of, I knew the course I was running. So I started making time after that. <clears throat> um, so I kind of cleaned up. Yeah. It was, a, it was a s hard out of the, out of the blocks. But right? after that, it was but after that. Yeah. I, like once I got a little bit of confidence and stuff and yeah, I was, uh, I did fine through selection. Um, yeah. yeah, it wasn't all that bad. So it just, yeah, it's more the, you, you never know. It was hard to not know where I stood. How old were you? Uh, like 32. Damn. Bro. Maybe no, no. I was like, no, 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 no. No, I, was say. Had, I had my daughter at 27 and then I was in ITC at 27. So okay. yeah, 26, 27. I was going to say 32 is old. No, nah, yeah. I think only one guy's done yeah, it I'm that my way old. out in 32. <laughs> what was that guy? Hogan. What Hogan? a fucking stud, oh, dude. Yeah, he's a machine. What so. a stud. Oldest. I think he was the oldest guy that ever uh, completed it. Yeah. And then not just completed it, but like broke records and smoked everybody. Yeah. Where you come from the recon community? No, bro. He was just like a, he was just a fucking random, <laughs> random. I think he came in as an E7 too. Yeah. I don't even know how he pulled that off. Yeah, they put him in team leader quick and like right out the yeah. gate, and he he crushed it all. Yeah, yeah, good for him. Good. Yes, right. I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> he just picks up everything naturally. He doesn't yeah. have to break his body down, work through injuries and all that right. other stuff. 
<laughs> drowning sure drown sure, in the pool. I'm sure he does a lot of prep work, but <clears throat> yeah. yeah. He's one of those guys. Natural athlete. That, yeah, he's one of those guys. He's a badass. So anyways, so you go through you go through ITC, become a Raider. Yep. Um, and then what, what's the uh, what's the career path? I mean, obviously the things you don't have to, obviously you can't share, you don't have to share, but yeah. Um, what's the what's the life look like after that? So I showed up to the team after that, um, and uh, I got in with the team because of good recommendations from when I was a support guy. Yeah. So Sal picked me up and put me in the team, um, and then I went right into a leadership position, believe it or not. Like, there was some feeling out process like there is for everybody else, but I feel like mine was a little bit expedited just because I had some team time as the support yeah. guy, so I fit right in. Um, they sent me... I mean, you say support guy, but again, like, I was on your team. You yeah. weren't really a support guy. You were just... Yeah, by you MOS. Were, by MOS, you were a support guy. Right. You were really just a team member. <laughs> you were just on the team. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so yeah, we got, got thrown right in there. Went uh, right to a centimeter position, um, and then went to a master breacher uh, school. And then I think we got deployed pretty quickly up to BMG where we replaced you yeah. up there. And that was the first trip, actually, as a, as a team guy. I actually want to talk yeah. about that, Mario, if you can remind me. I, I do want to talk about that, your la- that deployment. Yeah. That just pissed me the fuck off. Yeah. Talking about when everyone pulled out? Yeah, that's yeah. just fucking shit. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, That's uh, not where it finished, though. <laughs> um, so kind of a weird deployment, you know, up there. It's, it's kind of sporadic. We got into a couple of good gunfights up there. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't consistent. Not like the last one when we had the commando mission was a little more consistent. But uh, it was fun riding on dirt bikes in those hills, man. Like, the, the, we did Isn't some it? stuff up there that you, I, I never thought I would be doing, you know. Did you ever get to, did you ever get to ride out the back of the uh, yep. 47s? Yeah, so we yeah, land yeah. the 47s on ops and then have, it's, it's, uh, it's a good feeling to be starting up a, a, a motorcycle on the tail of a of a right. I tell people <laughs> a lot, I, I tell people all the time. Not that like we've talked about this in the past, right? Like we don't we would never go back. Yeah, I would never do it over again. Like it's done. That chapter is closed. I got yeah. a new life. You know, my life now is just fucking awesome. Um, I put a lot of that stuff to bed, but it is cool to say that like you rode dirt bikes out the back of yeah. a helicopter. You know so I mean? people ask me like, why do people have such a hard time getting the military? It's like, you know, what's better than skydiving with a machine gun strapped to your chest. Nothing. That's why it's hard to get. Out. <laughs> <laughs> right. <You know>? <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah, I, and I, I think uh, we were somewhere and I was like, Hey, has anybody ever taken uh ridden a dirt bike with, uh, with their friends off the back of a helicopter, um, carrying a bunch of guns. Yeah. And they're like, no, I'm like, yeah. I have. Yeah. And they're, oh, it was the school. We went and talked to the high school kids. You know, talking about, I was like, I have. And they're like, what? And, you know, from our generation, it's like we grew up watching like Delta Force and all these different uh, 80s action movies. Yeah. We got to live it. Yeah. We got to no, live it. Was, it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, looking uh, back, it was, it was cool. It was cool, you know, but that was a shit deployment that I want to talk about later. But anyways, after that, you went to, did another one. And yeah, so I uh, came back, uh, hit a pretty heavy school cycle, uh, ended up getting a free fall school, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. It was one of my big things. I was t- I've was i been afraid of heights my entire life. Really? The whole entire life. When I found out I was going to airborne school, I didn't sleep for probably three weeks. Shut up. I, like, I wish... Uh, Over I w- the pool that you... You had no you ter- had- terrified of terrified of heights. You ask anyone that knows me for a certain amount of time, like roller coasters and heights, I, I've hated my entire I've life. I missed that one. So, yeah, it, uh, yeah, I didn't think I'd sleep for like three weeks going into it, you know. And then uh, I, I wish I, I wish I had a picture of the the cruise. That's sheet. so that's so funny now knowing you because of how much airtime you actually have. Yeah. Well, after I got done, uh, I was after I got done free fall school, I still was nervous about it, and it bugged me the fact that I was getting paid to do it, and I was nervous. And that's why I started mm-hmm. buying gear. I'm like, I'm just gonna. Just lean into just, it. Just lean into it. And then yeah. I actually, once I, it was the trust in the gear. Once I understood, like, I got in enough weird positions and stuff and the parachute was still opening, then I was fine. Yeah. It was just, I had to get over that, that initial, like, you're falling as fast as you can <laughs> to the ground for part of it. You know? I think it's fucking awesome, dude. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's awesome. I, uh, I'm not going to do it anymore just because uh, I'm basically zip screwed back together at this point. Mm. But uh, maybe, maybe at some point later on. Kids are kids I with a really big out. shoot, a really big, yeah, soft. A big, big 280. <laughs> yeah, a really nice big, big, slowly flares up. Yeah, a nice big yeah. school bus over my head. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, you were getting kind of crazy there towards the end. Well, yeah, uh, well, yeah, that was after the last deployment. Everything was getting crazy at that point. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, and that, and that was your last deployment before you got hurt. Uh, ch- yeah, that was the last deployment before I got hurt. Um, right, I think that's right. I think so. BM, yeah, because the other one was a support guy. So yeah, yeah. support guy, BMG, and then Shindan after yeah. that. How many how many times, how long were you, did you do in the Marine Corps? Uh, I was medically retired, like right at 11 and a half years. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I hit the school cycle, and then we went right into the Shindan one. And then that's kind of like the catalyst of it when everything started. Like, it was a great deployment, but everything just absolutely fell apart. 
after that. Life in general. Life in general. Yeah, yeah. everything, just the, the fabric of what we were doing just kind it's of. It's weird. Just, uh, 12 year mark is like, uh, it's like a real dangerous, yeah. real dangerous year. People are going down for surgeries. People are breaking up. Yeah. Forces, you know, all the mm-hmm. human factor life crap that goes on yeah, outside and, of this. And our, that, during that time, I don't know if it's quite the same way because during that during that time from like my time from 2000 to 2012 and your incident was what 2013 14 for what the uh the crash when, when i got hurt or yeah, the, or the big hurt. crash no, no, i got no, hurt no. in 2000 uh it was may of 15 may of 15 couple, yeah a couple okay. months after the crash. josh was in 13 um but yeah that time frame because i think it was just the constant back to back to afghanistan yeah and the, like what we were doing um it just seemed like it fucking trashed people yeah like you you hit the the anywhere between 10 and 10 to 13 years yeah and like dudes were just like really really good guys yep were maybe making undesirable decisions yeah and then they were just getting you know and i don't want to bring up his name but one of the guys he gets a bronze star on one day and the next day he's like the he's the biggest piece of shit in the, the units ever seen i'm like how do you get a bronze star on Monday? Yeah. And then on Friday, you're... It does sound familiar. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you just said that he's one of the best Raiders that we've ever seen. You gave him a bronze star with a V, and by Friday, he fucked up, and, like, he's a piece of shit, and you're going to take his MOS. Right. Like, ma- make that make sense to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that made sense. And that's that's what... Not that I harbor any sort of resentment anymore, you know, and I don't because I had to learn that, you know, I was angry um, yeah. at, the, at the Marine Corps for a long time. Yeah, you and I've talked about that. <laughs> but I had to learn that uh, it's not the Marine. It wasn't the Marine Corps' job or Marsock's job to make sure Nick was yeah a good civilian or a good dad or a good husband. Yeah, they're not there to worry about your feelings. No, at all. They're wor- they're gotta go fight a war. Yeah, gotta fight a war. That's their that's their mission. <clears throat> Could they yeah. do a few things better? Yeah, probably. But yeah, it's not their mission. Not their mission. How long did it take you to realize that? Uh, are you still are you still trying? No, to- no. It was uh, it, it, like <clears throat> after I broke my pelvis on that parachute jump, I, I realized it really quickly because I went from like the golden boy, and then once they, as soon as I dropped paperwork to go to Wounded Warrior Battalion, which I wasn't mentally, I wasn't already checked out. Uh, but uh, I because they they gave me the option. I think they just wanted me to go there. It's like you can go there and, and still come back to the unit. I'm like I remember that. Which which yeah. I think, but then they need to get me off the books as an O three seventy two, so they can bring in somebody else in. Right. Once they once they found out that like I wasn't deploying with that team anymore, and they had to replace the certain skill sets, especially the intelligence stuff. Yeah, that was it. It was just kind of like and then turn in your badge and get out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was. Uh, other than that, but yeah, it, as soon as the utility was gone, then that they wrecks just, and that wrecks guys because. When you're told beforehand, no, this is a brotherhood, right. you're in for life, we'll take care of you forever. And the reality is it's a job yeah. that you do. And when yeah. you can't do that job, you're no longer useful. And that segues okay. into the last deployment because, like, the way how tight that team was, mm-hmm. it was like nothing I've ever seen before in my entire life, right? And then you go into, like, everything that's my last, transpired. My last team was like that, too. Yeah, and everything transpires after that, and then people start to separate. You're like, well, I still got these friends, but if they're still working, you don't, they're not, they're they gone got shit too. going on. Yeah, yeah. they're gone. It was it's not because they don't like you no more. It's it was just, the same exact story with me. And, and what's weird is, is uh, and I've told mine forever, you know, I've obviously got a book out about it. But um, when, like, for instance, Josh, I'll just bring Josh into it. You know, he was still on the team before he got hurt, before his parachute yeah. accident. So they were just going along. And he thought, well, Nick's out. He's having a good time. He's, he's good. And I'm doing my thing. So everything's good, right? Yeah. Not knowing that I was, like, in the darkest place of my life. Right. You know, missing my brothers you know and not that he like harbor you know he holds any sort of like guilt or anything like that at this point anymore but like it did affect him to find out after the fact because then it happened to him yeah because he got hurt and had to go through the same process he's like oh fuck you just get abandoned i'm like yeah yes yeah. that's, that's what happens and yeah. you feel abandoned because it's part of your identity yeah you're like this is what this is who i am and you were talking about it last night you were like um what, how'd you say it like you didn't realize how long it had it took you to like let go of that personality. Is that the way you were? Yeah, yeah. They said when we'll get into later in the plant medicine stuff, but yeah, it. Uh, I, I knew I was holding on to it. I just didn't know how how hard. How hard? How hard it was? Yeah, like and part how, of your how identity. It was, yeah, it was part of my identity. How bad it was affecting me, and like how much energy my daily energy was taken up of looking in the rearview mirror, looking at jobs to kind of get me back to where I could kind of start doing some of that stuff again. When in reality, like there's there's no chance I could do that anymore. One physically, mentally, you know, and the fact that I'm 
you know, got kids and stuff like that. Like your priorities change. Yeah. They change. Yeah. But mentally it was, I was still looking for that. Right. Like I would, I, I would look you at want these it, things and get charged up and think you want to be times. that guy still. Yeah. 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 I want to be the guy that everyone comes to and you know, like he solves problems and jumps out of planes with machine guns, you know? So I have a hammer and a scalpel. <laughs> I can do both. Yeah. Send me. <laughs> I'm really good at both. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, so that was so. Let's talk really quick about the uh, the career ending, and then and we'll kind of what happened after that. Yeah, uh, so that I'll go back to that last deployment. It was a really tight team. I had a, a couple of best friends in that team. Uh, Tom being one of them, Andy being the other. Um, and then so, but it was a it was a that it was the best plan we ever had because we did some wild stuff and we didn't lose nobody. Right? We had that's a win, dude. My position. That's, <laughs> that's exactly the same way my last deployment was. Yeah. We did some wild stuff and we brought everybody home. Yeah, a total yeah. fucking win. Due to unfortunate combat loss, and uh, we had to send our ops chief down down south, and I took over the ops chief position off, off after that, and then I turned into kind of mom and the team, which kind of transitioned over when we had the crash and stuff. So I was, uh, we have Tom, that's a go getter, right, and has yeah. all these great ideas and stuff like this, and, and then you have the team that's kind of worried about is Tom going crazy? You know, is it, is this a good plan? Maybe maybe a little bit. This stuff always worked out, but <laughs> yeah. we always kind of like, oh, I don't know, like do, can, we could. We could get the same result by doing something less dangerous, right? And that was always kind of like the fight. So I was the in between between the team. There was like, why are we doing this? We could just do it like this. And then I had to like kind of soften the information in between the two of them. So I was yeah. always in the in the middleman. So me and Tom always had a tumultuous relationship when we we're working, but we we're like best friends on the outside. Yeah, it was very odd. I never had anything like that before. Um, but uh, that's, racing, a, that's a good balance, though. Yeah, like you need that. Yeah, yeah, it's important to have. Yeah, so uh, great success on the deployment. We brought everybody home. We had a ton of operations. Like, we just, we worked all the oh, way. Yeah, I remember you guys did really good. Yeah, worked yeah. all the way into the end. Um, got a lot of good high-value targets. Um, yeah, best plan I've ever been on with a great group of guys. We get back, <clears throat> and then uh, guys start having problems. Wives and stuff like that, you know. That, that does happen, and it happened to me. So, I like, came back, got some bad news, and ran right basically into separation. <clears throat> uh, right into, you know, pending divorce. Um, and then... Yeah, that I wasn't equipped. So I, this is within a couple of weeks. I had not blown off any steam from that deployment. I was going to say, it's like the, it, unfortunately, it's like statistically, this is what happens. Yeah. But it's like, it, dude, it's like, what are the, what are the, it could not be worse timing. Right. Yeah. So, uh, like you said, you're not in the right headspace to deal with these kind of no. things. And we talked about it like last night. Like, you should be not making any <laughs> life decisions right. in this time period. No, no serious life decisions should be made in this bracket of time. Yeah. Yet here you are with yeah, you know. so I come off I come off that deployment and then went right into you know getting bad news and then like all of a sudden I, I I'm having processed the whole deployment or, or done my like you know had time to breathe whatsoever and I'm stuck in an apartment I'm couch hopping right this because I can't be home because this is fresh and then and then the alcohol started right so yeah, it was just it was Co already coping mechanism coping right? because yeah, yeah it was already kind of borderline before I, I would take hits you know like as I, I remember if I think back like that wasn't the catalyst of it it was a problem before because I would get off deployments. And then I would just sit on that couch and wait for the next one and drink, you know, but yeah. I would still show up to work. I would still perform. I still have my physical capability, but then uh, like, it's funny, man. It's, it's not funny. It's sad because yeah. it was the, like what you just described was the exact thing I was doing as well towards yeah. the end. Yeah. It was just coping. No, you're just a war junkie at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. I would just sit and wait for the next one. I would look at gear online. It was just, and I would do the same shit at work. You know, yeah. it just was, um, <clears throat> so come off and then, yeah, the drinking started being a problem because I was still, in high demand for what the job I was doing. Um, and then uh, we were already getting geared up for the next one. So I got every, my everything at home shit. And then all of a sudden, then I'm, I'm still having off gas from the deployment. Plus I got all these other things going on. So I'm just, I'm just coping with booze, right? Yeah. Um, I can make it work. I can do everything I'm supposed to be doing. And so I'm, I'm like right on that edge um, of, uh, you know, I, I can keep it together good enough. And, you know, but I was still basically drinking myself to sleep for every single night. Um, and then we got, <clears throat> I went down for a back surgery after that. And that was kind of like, after that things started getting really, like really weird. I was struggling with, uh, with back problems for about nine years. I didn't really tell anybody about it. People that knew me close knew about them, but I, I mean, I was, I had rubber bands on my boots because <clears throat> I couldn't bend over time my shoes and I was still jumping out of airplanes. So I got to the point where I lost all feeling in my feet. And then they were worried about me having to like wear prosthetics and I'm still active. I'm still active in the team. I'm not like wounded warrior at this point. I'm like, these are big problems. So <clears throat> I opted to have the surgery. Were you self-medicating other than alcohol? Uh, it, so look, not that I could not that, not then, not, not then. then. Cause it, it, it depended on access. Right. So when I started having the surgeries and this is before the crackdown, when the pain meds were a problem, 
then yeah, I was using. So that came after. That came afterwards, okay. right? Because this is all pre like crackdown from the, when yeah. the oxycontin stuff started happening. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I have the I have the surgery, and then so they had to detach me from the team for a little bit because when you have the surgery, they get requalify your parachute system, then they have to evaluate you, then they put you back on the team, right? So I'm kind of like off the books at this point. Um, and then as I'm rehabbing, we're uh, surgery was February, and then as I'm rehabbing, um, <clears throat> it was uh, see, I remember. March 9th, uh, they, uh, I got a call from Andy and, and Liam. And then as I just called in and checked with them, they were down in Florida doing a, a training operation. Uh, they were just going to have a couple of helicopters. They were just going <clears> to <throat> stop at, uh, I think it was Eglin Air Force Base. Yeah. Yep, load the guys up, do, do some race trucks, practice getting off the helicopter, getting back on. Pretty easy stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got a call the 9th, and then uh, they were like, these like, I asked how everyone was doing. They're like, dude, it, we ain't going to do shit down here. Like, this, the, the weather's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's coming in. We're looking at the weather report. The base is basically shutting down. Like, there's no way we're going to lift. We're just going to sit here. We came all the way down to get rained on for the most part. And then uh, <clears throat> that was in the morning. And then uh, I got a phone call later that night with the same two guys. They're pissed. They're like, dude, they're, they're making us go. Like, I was like, what do you mean they're making you go? I was like, they're, we're going to lift tonight. And I was like, it's raining. I, like, I can see the storm cloud in front of me. I was like, it's like, what do you, I was like, that's, that's base commander issue, right? And I was like, well, they're, they're talking about it. They're seeing. So they're, no one really knows who said yes and who said no to this yeah. whole entire thing, right? So, I'm getting these phone calls as day, and I'm not thinking much of it because it's like you think like Camp Lejeune, like they, they shut everything down for weather. And this, they're usually pretty good about it. You know, if they see something, they get a weather report. They're just saying, hey, we're not flying helicopters today. Like I, I didn't cross my mind that they were going to push it, you know, or whoever, whoever approved it. Right. And then uh, <clears throat> I got a phone call. I was driving into work because I still had to check in. I was on uh, I still couldn't do I was on light duty. And then I was driving in and then Tom's wife at the time called me and uh just you could hear her it just rattled and I, I just i had no idea what was going on i this is the first person i've heard from it and then uh he said Did he, um have you seen the news and i said i said no i haven't seen the news i'm driving in right now he's like there's a blackhawk clash down in florida he's like he's like everyone's down in florida right now it's like tell me this is a different group and i was like i i don't know <clears throat> and then uh so I don't have time to look at it. I'm driving in. So I talked to her for a while i was like yeah, i'm sure it's nothing you know i would me of all people would have heard something by now i would have got a phone call so I kind of reassured her <clears throat> and then I uh, hung up and then Will calls me really like three minutes later. He's like, dude, are you coming in? He's like, I was like, yeah. He's like, you need to get here as soon as you can. And then so I'm driving in, in my mind. I already knew it. Like it was just kind of like it was it was a weird feeling. You just don't know exactly. What. I don't know exactly. Right. So yeah. I'm thinking like <sighs> maybe who knows? I mean, I, I, under, I I've been in the military long enough to understand what a helicopter crash equals it, mm -hmm. it equals zero survivors. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, you could be 10 feet off the ground. You're still not going to get survivors of the amount of gas those things carry. Um, so I get in there and everybody is lined up inside the team room. Uh, it's be brass leadership. Uh, ben Pappas is in there, everybody. And they sat us down <clears throat> and they explained to us that uh, uh, they lifted off uh, that night. They caught some, uh, they were, you know, they, they had like zero, zero to no visibility. The, the pilot, <clears throat> this may be off because there's reports out there and stuff. I'm just going off memory right now. But you got, kind of got lost because usually if you're in thick fog, usually with the helicopter, you want to pull power, gain elevation so you get a clear sky, and then descend down to a safe landing area. I think he was kind of wobbling all over the place due to wind, and then when he pulled power, he ended up pulling power to the side and pulled power into the water. And that's how it ended up crashing. So that's what was, how it explained to us. And then they told us then that it's like there's, <clears throat> there's no survivors. Everyone's, everyone's dead. Okay? So what do we do after that? So it... it I remember getting the initial blank. If it, it sounded like like glass was breaking in my head, it was the weirdest thing ever because it was just like I was so tied in with that team, and then my home life is crap at this point. So I'm kind of leaning on the guys, but now those guys are wiped off the face right. of the earth, right? So I feel really alone at this point. You know what I mean? And I know I know I got this this substance abuse problem that's creeping in, and this just just gonna throw a fucking gasoline on it. So I, I was personally terrified because I didn't know what I was gonna do. It's like finally I got all these people. I got where I wanted to be, and gigantic rug pull. You know, like, what do I... Family's falling apart. Family's falling apart. Like, fell apart. Yeah. So it's like everything happened at once. Um, so after that, we had to go... <clears throat> like, and, and to be fair, like, the, like that's an enormous, enormous amount of weight for a human being to carry. Right. Carry. Like, that's a lot, dude. That's a lot. Right. And nobody, nobody at the time was processing it, right? Because it, it was fresh, and we had work to do, right? Because yeah. everything's coming up, so... What do you do after that? You try to find a way to be busy, right? <laughs> find a way to get involved and, you know, so well, I know what's going on. The wives do not know what's going on yeah. at all, right? They're watching Fox News. So we and, and one other guy goes over there and we were kind of like the, uh, 
the liaison between them and the command. Because uh, as as they're going through the crash and stuff, I'm getting phone calls from people down there saying like they've they're pulling up body parts, you know. So it's it it's it's a done deal, right? So we're trying to keep it under wraps as best we can. And you see the wives going through this process where they're just like they're all over the place, and and they're asking us like what happened, and we legally can't say nothing. We're on a gag order at this point because we have to wait for official notification when the guys show up in uniform at your at your house. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> but that that was that was tough. We're sitting there day in and day out. And I know what's going on. I'm I'm looking at. The wives are right in their eyes and knowing the information that they want to know that kind of so they can get through it and move on. But I can't say nothing like I, they would I, I lose rank like, you know, they punish what me. A, what an impossible decision like place to be. In there. Right. So we hung out with them for a few days. Um, we went up to Dover to do the after notification, official notification came through. Uh, we went up to Dover, um, helped out get the, the uh, caskets off the airplane. And then we started the funeral process after that. We had hometown funerals and then we did uh, Arlington. And I still hadn't processed shit. And then the, as far as like the drinking go, it's just ramping up, right? Because I'm, I mean, I can't function. I'm drinking in the morning at this point. I, I'm doing eulogies and like, I'm just so out of my mind. Like I, I have to get some of it, like some booze in me just so I can like level off. So I can like talk to these people and not show any kind of emotion, right? Because I'm mm. trying to stay strong for everybody. <clears throat> and then, uh, so we get through all the funerals and stuff like that. And they, they went pretty well. There's, there's a couple of people that sat on their hands that could probably do more, but I don't know. How, how many people, how many? Total seven, seven from us. It was nine, uh, I believe 11 total with crew. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Seven total from us. Um, so we get through the funeral process and then I'm driving back from Arlington and then it hits me after that. Like just like a, absolute, the last one. Yeah. The, the last, last one. Cause now I'm done now. <clears throat> and then I don't, um, everyone was kind of on to me at this point where the, the fact that I was, I was drinking way too much. Um, so they already had plans to move me to another team um, but then they're kind of like, they're, they're keying off this at this point. Right. So they're, they're, they don't know. They, I asked for a break. I said, just put me in the schoolhouse for a while. I'd like, like, no, you have certain, there's certain skill sets I had that they needed in the next team over. They couldn't just rapidly reproduce that. So they just moved me over and then hope for the best for the most part and make sure I wasn't going to get a DUI or something to the point where they like, they just wanted me to like live with somebody and then I wean myself off and stuff. Like they, it was very apparent that I was falling apart, but they still needed that dude in the team. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Um, <clears throat> you filled a slot and they filled needed, a slot, you, they yeah. needed you to fill that slot. So yeah, when I got back, that was kind of, means the end after that, it was just, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, just was just drinking like crazy. I wasn't showing up to work. Uh, once I stopped showing up to work, the people were checking on me. And then finally <clears throat> I ended up opting to, I let everyone know what was going on. Cause I was getting at the end of my rope the suicide problems coming in, you know, like I was, it was, it was an absolute mess. I'm living by myself. I got no friends. I'm in an apartment down in surf city with like these shitty shutter blinds. I'm hating life. Like I'm just drinking all day long. It was just like the worst, worst feeling I've ever had in my entire life. So I let the command know <clears throat> they put me in an inpatient process, um, kind of marginal, marginal, you know, success at that, you know, got me off it for a while, but problem is with these places, you need kind of a soft landing area. You can't just go from chaos go do, do some work and then come back to the chaos, right? There's, there's other things you have to change. And I was still in at the same time. So it, uh, the sobriety kind of failed pretty quickly, yeah. like right after that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you were living on a roller coaster for a while. Yeah. Um, so I was able, some sobriety, like I, I, I dialed it back to the point where I could be functional in the team. I could still PT. And then they moved me over to the other team. And then, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, then after that, I got into the parachute wreck. And then that was like the catalyst after that. And then, then I knew like the writing was the wall. I was officially done. So, um, yeah, I was uh, getting ready for to go to the barrel jumpers course. I needed like 50 extra jumps and they said they would take civilian jumps. <clears throat> and then, uh, so I was like, cool. So I went out to Rayford. I'm just racking up jumps left and right. It was mm -hmm. a very military. Yeah. Um, jump zone. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. Very military yeah. jumps. So I was racking up jumps. I had one where I got dropped a little bit outside of, uh, out of where I should have, I was flying in, and it was probably operator air. <clears throat> I was flying in, and I got myself, I was too low. I was got myself in a corner where the pack shed's at, if you remember the area and where the planes are at. So I was in that corner. So I was either had a choice of going shooting between two trees or going to an active runway with the plane landing. So I ended up opting to go shoot in between two t uh, trees. Parachute got clipped. I lost air on one side and fell about 25 feet, and then broke my broke my left hip. Um, shattered, hit the tree first. Yeah. hit the tree, took it and I kind of wrapped around and then I yeah, fell. Right. Um, shattered my pelvis. It was uh, the open book pelvic fracture. So I got pins and plates all over there, put a bolt through my hip <clears throat> and then I broke my left orbital. Um, and then, so yeah, at that point then I was definitely 
<laughs> going to get processed out with uh, with zero plan at all. Well, just to go go back, didn't you code out on the the flight out to yeah. the hospital? Yeah, there. Uh, I almost had pad. I had pads on me. Um, it was bringing close where they almost uh, had to use electricity on me. My heart rate was getting messed up. I had they had to push whole blood into me because I was bleeding inside my pelvis. So it was getting real close. I was, was going to ask. I, I don't. I remember that you did that happen, but I don't think I ever knew why because it did, never made sense. Like why? Why did you? Why did I have to throw pads on you? Because the bird. So they're um, with your pelvis. You got your uh, inferior uh, vena cava. So the, the, I mean, these are major vessels, yeah. right? They're the size on of the a side of, size of a rope, yeah. right in your back. When all those <clears throat> when those bones break, they're like little jagged, you know. Sp- spikes for the most part and i had i didn't hit the vena cava but i hit other ones whether i had bleeds inside so i was bloated i was bloated with blood in my pelvis um so when all the blood's in your pelvis you don't have it circulate in your body and then you'll you'll see it in the monitor uh your heart rate will start going crazy you know and then so like they had pads on me because they knew i was what they call it hypovolemic mm-hmm. um and then it takes a while to get the blood products in for it actually to work so if i were to go into cardiac arrest and they have the pads they can shock me and get me right back and keep pushing blood in after that so it was uh, it was real close it was completely critical yeah, uh, yeah. They flew me to Walmac on Fort Bragg, and then Walmac. It was like Memorial Day weekend time frame. Didn't have like a, a face and pelvis surgeon, <laughs> so they had they flew me to Coastal Carolina to a level one trauma center over there. And they uh, I remember when it all happened. I was like, "Can we just fucking stop?" Because of the, cra- the other crash happened, and then we dealt with all that, and then then this like you were kind of up and down, yeah. And then this happened. I'm like, "Can we just get a fucking break here?" Jesus Christ, yeah. man, this is like awful yeah it was one thing after another um i remember you coming down to visit vaguely it was kind of like uh yeah, you were not now nah, the, yeah. the pain control was flowing yeah. you know yeah and then uh i was in between surgeries and stuff like that a lot of people came in it was like blips on the radar yeah. you know it was just kind of like people would come in like hey man what's going on i look like oh hey and then just kind of drift back to sleep i was honestly just happy you were alive man yeah at this point a lot of people yeah. were at that point um so yeah, hey, everything got way worse after that. If you think it could get worse at that point, it got worse. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so it, it continues. Um, as I was rehabbing, like, the, the alcohol start, just kept going. Yeah. Like, I was just, because now, now I'm, you lose all your friends, you're sitting there, you're like, oh, man, this is oh, the you worst were su- thing. you were super alone at this point. So, yeah, now I'm really alone, and I'm broke, yeah. right? So, like, when I hit hard times, I can always lean on the fact that I still have my body, I still have my physical ability, I can still do things. I still, I still have things I can control in my life, I can still control. One of the most physically capable people I know, and you were essentially for all like crippled. Yeah, completely crippled. Yeah, at this point. Yeah, completely crippled. The outlook was on. I was going to be in a wheelchair for about five months. I was going to yeah. walk her for four, and then a cane. And then the, the, depending on where that bolt was in my head, they didn't know if I was going to be disabled the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, and then that wasn't something I wanted to live with, right? So, um, yeah. The, so drinking got way worse. This is like the the big big downturn and i remember when i got back and i started getting lucid and then uh i'm I'm in like the rehab phase i remember looking at my face and my face is crooked right because my orbital is broken my it looks like my eyes down here i'm in a walker staring at the in my face in the mirror and i looked at myself i'm like you you have one year motherfucker and then you're gonna end it if you don't get if you're not back to where you're at like i made that my promise myself i put myself on a fucking clock like right then and there um which stuck with me but it took me a while to get going (laughs) got right right towards the end there um so i remember um yeah so through the whole rehab process like i kind of half-assed it man i was just i was sitting on the couch i was still drinking uh and then then pain pills like i was real liberal with the pain pills just because it was before the crackdown and then uh it it was there was like no problem you know for them to pass those things out in fact like i had to go take myself off like talking to the doctor like i remember because you came over i want to say it was july 4th yeah Remember that? Yeah. Like you guys, you guys came over and I was like, fuck, John is fucking gone. Yeah. Booze and pills. You were gone. (laughs) And I was like, what the fuck do we do with this? Yeah. Cause like you, you inebriated, even injured is a dangerous thing. You know what I mean? Cause like if you got a guy that's super capable physically, even injured, and then you, you know, you booze him up and pill him up. It's like, you're just a, like a walking time bomb. Yeah. And especially with everything you had just been dealt with, it was, it was scary. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people are, are afraid for, for me and what was going on. I was afraid too. Like I said, I put me on myself on that timeline. I knew it was looming. Um, so I ended up, I, I went in, um, I got myself off the pain pills. <clears throat> I went and talked to the doctor. He didn't, they didn't want to take me off. I remember having the conversation with them. Like, 
you say, well, why do you want it? Because this is before like the doctors believed that these things were actually addictive because they were sold as like non-addictive yeah, prescription pills that you take for a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this is still when that, we're in that phase where doctors aren't really on board with like these things are absolute poison. Mm-hmm. Um, so when took, uh, I remember talking to the doctor and he's like, well, why do you want to come off? He's like, it seems like they're working for you. I was like, they are, and I, I'm doing great. Everyone else is always mad at me though. Yeah. So I feel like <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> it might be me, yeah. you know, cause everyone's constantly pissed. Maybe I'm the <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, he, he asked me, he's like, well, there's a process to get off of them. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to do any of that shit. I'm just going to stop taking them. Yeah. Cause in my mind, like I'm not, I'm not scoring dope off the street. You know, yeah. I'm just, I'm getting stuff that's prescribed to me. Was I taking more than I should? Absolutely. You know, cause that's where I was at in life at that point. But, uh, I was like, no, no, no. Like I'm, I'm it's not, I'm not a drug addict, you know? And then, uh, and then I went through not one of those drug addicts. Yeah. Not one of the, yeah. Not one of these, <laughs> these losers over here. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm different. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm getting it from a doctor. Um, but, uh, and then, so I opted not to do suboxone, methadone, any of those treatments like that. And then I hit withdrawals. It was, it was brutal. It was like for three weeks straight, my brain was gone, just sick, diarrhea, you name it. Um, I'm glad I, I didn't opt to do the Suboxone route. I mean, I was really close for a while, but you see guys that, that do go that route, it seems like they're on it forever. Mm-hmm. After that, like they never, they never, they kick never it. really kick it. Yeah. yeah. So I went through hardcore opiate withdrawals and that was, uh, that was probably one of the worst three weeks of my life. That did was, you do that with, with care or did you just do that on your own? No, I did it at home like a dumbass. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, like an idiot. Um, so I ended up kicking that, um, which I'm, I'm glad cause that, that would have progressed, uh, pretty rapidly. Um, so I got off the pills and then, uh, <clears throat> and then they, yeah, they transitioned me over to Wounded Warrior Battalion. And then they started processing me out after that. Um, yeah, so I walked out, I walked out, I came into the command, a, a young man, and I walked out of it with a crooked eye and a, and a walker, turned in my, turned in my security badge as I walked out the door. So it's an eerie feeling, isn't it? Turn it that is. badge in. Yeah, it is a turn yeah. that in. And then it, 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 it's. It was a distinct drop off in like, not friendships, right? It's just the amount yeah. of communication you have. That with door them. shuts. That door shuts. It's like your phones almost. They move on. And they still love you, and they'll still hang out with you, but it's yeah. they got their stuff going on. Yeah, you know? their life continues there behind the door, and you're on the outside of it. Yeah, yeah. That was a that was an interesting thing. That door shut after I turned the badge in. I'm like, oh fuck, the door shut. Right. I couldn't get back in if I wanted to. Yeah. Like, it's over. Yeah. <clears throat> you got no one to call, you no. know, it's just, you're, you're on your own. You're right? your own. It sounds, when you're thinking about it, it sounds like a good idea. Like, Oh, I have all this freedom and stuff, but dude, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. yeah. It's like initially you, it's horrible. Initially. Yeah. No, it gets better over time depending yeah. on how, how much, fast you can, you can uh, yeah, wrap how, your head how much, it. how much work you can put in on yourself. Or if you had a damn plan when you're supposed to get out. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I had <laughs> right. no plan when I was going to get out. I had big plans to go up DC. Well, and, I don't know. Yeah. I had a decent plan, I think. And I was still fucked. So yeah. Yeah, so uh, I went to the Warrior Battalion, uh, went through all the, the med board process and stuff like that. Um, and then <clears throat> we, yeah, med board process, I got out and then uh, ended up moving up to, <clears throat> so drinking was still a problem here. Big yeah. problem, right? It was still going on. You know, I was uh, I was back on my feet, but I was still, like, I still had the same mental problems I had because I hadn't processed the crash. I hadn't processed any of my emotions. I'm just, now I'm out with all kinds of extra problems, right? Because now money's a problem. Now yeah. now you have nothing to do, right? You don't have your guys around you. Now you got to figure stuff you weren't, out. You had no mission. I had no mission whatsoever, right? Yeah. And then because I, I relied on my physical capability to get me places, right? So that right. was, was, was going to go three-letter up in D.C. or contract or whatever. I just Something I could just, like, if I wasn't good at it, but I can, I know I had the endurance to get through it. So I can, but once that's gone, like, I, so we uh, <clears throat> made a bunch of bad decisions after that. I moved up to the New England um, and then for like some business opportunity that fell apart, like very, like rapidly quickly. And then that's when <clears throat> we, uh, yeah, you got the f- couple phone calls from up there. Yeah. And I was, I was going to bring, I was one of the, I was fucking, it did like, it absolutely crushed me. And I've had to do it before. Um, back when we were working with veterans, it, it, it had to do it before, but never had to do it to my friend. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, I got a phone call and, uh, where there's a gun involved. Yep. And late at night too, wasn't it? Yeah. Like super or early, early in the morning, late at night, early. It was in the late morning. at night. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I had to make the call to, out of fear of your own life and fear of your family's life at the time, I had to make a call and call, the, and fucking call the cops on my friend. Yeah. And um, I remember sitting there going, fuck, am I about to do this? Am I, I'm about to, like, I'm about to call a, like a dear friend one of my best friends in this unit 
um, that I connected with the most and for the most time. And I'm going to fucking call the cops on him because he's like, I'm, I'm in fear of his own life and his family's life. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to try to get emotional, but thank God that the guy that I ended up getting on the phone, and I don't even know how this worked out, but we ended up calling. I ended up talking to the officer that, that responded, and thank God he was a vet. Yeah. And he totally, totally yeah. fucking was like wired like in on what was going on. Right. And I don't know what happened, obviously. If yeah. I mean, I do third hand, but like you can kind of like after that, yeah, I know. So I just it was just drinking all day, just completely frustrated. Like everything fell apart. So now we're like, we sold all of our stuff down in North Carolina. This business opportunity fell apart. Now I'm stuck, right? So like yeah. life has gotten worse now. And we're still, saying, and still. Nothing, nothing has it changed. It keeps getting worse. Keeps, yeah. Yeah, nothing has changed in my behavior. Yeah. And these things keep getting shittier, right? Right. So I weird felt, how that happens, weird right? Weird how that happens, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I was, yeah, just sitting there drinking on the couch. I had a pistol I was playing with. It wasn't like I was inactive, like I was going to do anything with it to hurt myself or like that. But I was just out of my out of my fucking mind, right? There's a kid, there's your kids there, kids there, yeah. yeah. Thing, yeah. It's just everything. All all this is bad yeah. at this point, right? So the house is cleared out, and then uh, I'm glad that officer came in with the demeanor he did, right? Because I'm not thinking straight. I'm yeah. angry. I'm pissed. If they would have came in like unsnapped and started barking commands, it probably would have been suicide by cop, yeah. right? That's the kind of state I was in at yeah. that point. He came in without his without his belt on. No I, shit. He came in without his belt on. That's he had his ballsy. jacket on. He showed it to me real quick and he sat down and he just started bullshitting with me is, is the approach he took, which I'm very thankful to this day that, that he did do that and that you talked to him and he didn't yeah. make that decision to do that because I, I don't know. I was in a weird state of mind. That's I, what you needed. I, I don't want to hurt anybody. Yeah. You, you didn't know? need some fucking, some guy to come in all, you know, fucking aggressive and yelling and everything. Cause you would have met the same energy. Yeah. You would have just rose your energy to match that energy. Right. They yeah. did that on purpose. Huh? So a good dispatcher, if there's something going on, especially with like a vet, they'll make sure that a vet is responding to it because anybody else that would have responded to that would have came in hot. Yeah, you get some... Would have, would have came in with a completely different attitude and probably yeah. would have fucking made it worse. Yeah, some so. rookie would have came in there with the, like unsnapped and stuff and posturing. It, like you said. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> I know I would I would have raised that. I wouldn't have hurt anybody, obviously, but I, it would have put did them you, in a very good Did you guys position. get training on that? No, but I, I know that if if, I, if there's a good dispatcher and they there's something going on with the vet, they'll make sure that the a vet responds. Mm. So, and then the, we'll understand, like, if we are going for backup, we're, we're behind the scenes until something actually needs to, to happen. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't remember his name, but I'm, I'm very thankful that, that he came in there like that. I just remember talking to him. And I, I, th- I want to say he was a Navy vet, and okay. he was like, he like he knew. It's almost like he knew the scenario before I even explained it to him. Okay, and I was like, thank the universe for that. This guy is the one that fucking took the call. Yeah, you know, because that could, like you said, that could have just fucking ended badly. And it was, dude, honestly, it was just like, I can't believe I'm. And obviously, it's not like. I just can't believe that I was like having to be put in that position. Cause like, this is the last thing you want to do to your friend is call it like, it's your friend. Yeah. You don't want to fucking call the cops on your friend. Yeah. Cause you don't know what that's going to, especially when there's guns involved, there's a kids involved. Like that could have fucking root complete one. It could go super negative and you could yeah. get suicide by a cop Two, If the cops an asshole or you become an asshole or whatever that happens, like say nobody dies, but now there's fucking charges, there's kids, there's guns, there's, you know, it could go so many different negative ways. Yeah. And then that, that, there's no positive reaction after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there was, thank God. So, yep. Um, so just rewind real quick as I want to cover this beforehand. So, uh, just want to give you some gratitude, man. Like, uh, I was up there. Um, I, at this point, I think we're talking, like I barely get off the couch and the VA was trying to put me on schedule dilaudid mm-hmm. at that point. And then we started talking to you, like you getting me to Jeff yeah. started this whole journey. Like yeah. th- there's, there's no way I would still be sitting here today if that, that call wasn't made and you didn't get me up to Jeff at performance first. It, there's, there's absolutely no way. So I want to thank you. Like from the bottom of my heart, uh, dude, it's, you have no idea. Like I wasn't fixed after that, you no, know, it was it's a long just, journey, it's just but, like, the beginning, but getting my physical ability back and the confidence knowing that I'm not going to fall apart if I bend over like that, that was absolutely huge. So that happened in between. So I just want to make sure. Yeah. So that was the, that was the thing that came out because you needed to be removed from your environment yeah. cause the, because that's so much bad shit had happened, which I don't think that program's in existence anymore. Well, he was with his other business partner that, uh, yeah. 
things didn't work out, but uh, he's got his own place now. And we still, I still have good communication with him. Yeah, we still talk and stuff like that. He's he's talking about Jeff Nichols. He's probably one of the best trainers, physical trainers, uh, retired Navy SEAL, but also one of the best probably physical uh, coaches yeah. in the world, Yeah, hands down. And at the time, they were running a uh, kind of like a rehabilitation for special operations guys. Yeah. Um, all in all, completely all encompassing, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, they sent me down there. Uh, they shit, they ran blood work on me. Uh, yeah. they did all my bias. They DEXA scanned me. Um, and then they basically like, and I'm I'm coming down there at, like almost just out of a wheelchair, and I can't get off the couch. Yeah. And this is this is a, a strength and conditioning program that they're gonna put me through. So I remember talking to both of them, and they're like, "You're gonna sign all the waivers we have. Yeah. If you if we break you here, you're gonna own this place if you wanted it. Mm -hmm. You know, like we just we just can't do that here. So yeah." And I started with a band around my knees and I started with uh, just blocks and lunging. I would just stand like that's what I would do for the first week. It was just walk with a band around my legs and then like just stand up on lunging. How long was it? The whole uh, thing? Like nine weeks. Yeah. I want to say nine weeks. And then. So, so I'm just to shout out, uh, you know, because how it got paid for. So our, the nonprofit covered, I want to say half of it because mm -hmm. it wasn't cheap. Like no. to, to send somebody there for nine weeks for a full. Yeah. And this is not supported by the military. This is completely like these are. Yeah. And uh, listen, I don't want to bash the VA. I don't want to bash anything. But the reality is when a guy is that was in your position in that bat off, the VA doesn't, they're not equipped to do it the right way. Yeah. They're just going to give you more meds and send you to counseling. Yeah. And, uh, and physical therapy, maybe. Yeah. Basic physical therapy. And you needed an intense inpatient treatment. Yeah. Like, Live in, I lived in with them. You yeah. lived in there yeah. and they take care of, so it's not cheap. Um, but boot campaign, um, Morgan Luttrell's uh, organization he was involved with at the time. Uh, do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they paid for half and then. The, oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that happened. Yeah. I want to say, I want to say they paid for half of it, um, working through Jeff. Okay. And then we ended up, uh, the, the Raider Project covered the other half. Yeah. Which was, you know, saved the fucking life, man. Yeah. No, I went in there uh, in, a, in a ton of pain and then could barely walk. And then I think in the first month. I was deadlifting, walking, I could run, I could jog, it's crazy, you know, like dude. that's, yeah, that's exactly what I needed. Like once I put all the muscle back around my hips and my pelvis, like Did you work pain, with Vernon too. Yeah. And he fucking great. Yeah. He was, yeah. he was, he was hard to work. <laughs> Not hard. He's a great trainer. He just, he likes to push you. Yeah. I would get a little bit of love from Jeff from time to time. Like, Oh, you just take it a little easier, <laughs> you know, not Vern. He would, yeah. He would, yeah. A little bit of punishment there. But yeah, no, everyone in that, that facility was phenomenal. Um, yeah. They take, they cook here, your diet, your yep. blood work, your physical therapy, your rest, yep. decompression. Um, how did you do during that time when they put you in the uh, decompression tanks? I did fine with it. Uh, really? It took me a while. Yeah, I didn't freak. Are you talking about the float tanks? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I took me a while. Initially, that shit fucked me up. It, like, it just didn't like the feeling of it? Yeah, like, it, it was like I wasn't in control. Yeah. So, and we talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, me not being in control was an issue, yeah. right? So as soon as I got in a place where it's, like, completely dark and I'm just weightless and, like, obviously the pain helps, like, because the pain goes away, any sort of pressure. Yeah. But dude, like pure panic initially. Yeah, it was odd at first, but I was able to relax. I couldn't. Uh, it took me about like three or four tries, and then I could fall asleep in it, and then I got the benefits from it. I think that's like where they want you to be, where you yeah. actually like, relax enough to fall asleep in it. I enjoyed it, and then the massages and stuff like that. No, it was a, a great all encompassing thing. You know, it was exactly what I needed. Um, like I said, I, I left that place in probably better shape than I left the, not left the military before, like pre. Yeah. Oh, or pre uh, parachute crash. Yeah, you Way were better shape. You were definitely like you leaned back out. You had yeah. put mus. You had put mus. You looked like yourself. Yeah, like before you didn't. You looked like a a strung out <laughs> version of yourself. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like not the John Stevens that I that I knew. Yeah, not the, not the John Stevens that I knew either. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Uh. After that, things drastically improved. Right. I pulled out of a <clears throat> out of New Hampshire. Um, and then got into a relationship and moved to Texas and had a lot of couple good years. Um, you know, I was there for about six years. Um, and then, yeah, so I was able like the, the drinking calmed down. I was still doing it off and on, you know, I would have like, I would buckle down for, cause I was, uh, I went to paramedic school. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, you know, cut it off for that and then accomplish what I needed to accomplish. Yeah, but when I had downtime, hi, a, a special operations dog. I, I think I made, I made fun of you. Renaissance when you did man. This. Yeah. <laughs> cause I was like, wait a minute. So you're a, a special operations dog handler is not good enough. A raider is not good enough. Some of the other things you did at Marshawk, that's not good enough. I'm also going to become a paramedic, like a badass <laughs> paramedic as well. I was like, John, what are, what are we doing? He's like, I don't know. We're going to do it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Now I, I get, like I said, I get bored easy. I'm trying to get better about that because it's caused me a lot of problems in the past where I never feel comfortable in one spot, you know? So yeah. it's a, it's still a process, but yeah, everything's got better after that. I got my physical ability back. I got through school. I was in a good relationship for quite some time and then, uh, <clears throat> everything, everything was going great. Um, but I still like the drinking thing was a problem for me. Right. Cause I, I would have these, I would kind of go in waves. I had three months good and then I would kind of dive off and I would make mistakes. And Why do you think that those, like what was triggering those dive offs? So looking back on it now, having hindsight, I was, I was just upping the distractions. I wasn't dealing with the core problem, right? I hadn't, mm-hmm. I hadn't grieved anything from the crash. I didn't grieve like any motion and, and, and all the combat stuff. Like I kind of just put that shit in, in a box in the back of my head and then was pushing forward. Cause that's, that's how I usually I dealt with problems. Like you have all this, these problems here, you just get busy and later on you get enough tomorrows in between that, you know, that time, that point, then things start to get easier, like, which it does. But it doesn't go away. And it, I think it, it stays in there and affects you in different ways later yeah. on. And that's where I was kind of at because I, I had I had everything I needed to have, right? Like I, I was in a good relationship. We had money. The kids are good. I was in a big house. Like everything, all metrics were fine. But I still had this like wet blanket on me where I'm just like I had this angst and this this depression like that I couldn't shake. But the distractions like with work and whatever, everything else I was doing would just keep me away from that. So I was Do just. Do you think that's why you were doing that, the work that you were doing? Yeah, it could, while I was doing the work I was doing and the, the things the things I was doing because I, I was, you look at you look at PTSD when they go through the list you're like nightmares, uh, fireworks, all yeah, these yeah. other things. You look at the back page. There's one that says accomplishment seeking, <laughs> which I didn't know about at all until I figured it out. But it's like it, it's part of the, the process, right? Because you're 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 refusing to deal with the problems you have or process or go see a therapist to work on your shit, right. and you're diving into these projects that don't relatively mean shit to your life, but you're just doing it because you think. In my mind, like going through the funeral process, I remember a lot of people come up to me and, and they would say, you're still here for a reason. And for me, I took that shit personally and like seriously, because I'm, I'm still, and so I, I'm holding, I'm looking for anything to hold on to. And then I hold on, no, you're still here for a reason. In, in my brain, it's like we, I had seven dead friends on my hands. Like, so I'm curing cancer after this. Like, so I feel like I have to add up yeah. to that loss. Right. So then I'm accomplishment seeking, thinking like, this is. If I accomplish this bullshit task that has nothing to do with my life or will improve it, I'll get that dopamine hit and everything will be fine. And I would push and out everyone in my life just to accomplish that. And I'll rise to the occasion to make my life worth it. Right. And I would push out everyone out of my life and piss everyone off so I can accomplish this one thing. I get there and then all of a, it, it would get done. And I'm like, well, that's not it. On to the next. And now you're alone. because Now I'm pushed, alone. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, so I, I cut off drinking, right? So I'm saying I've had all these problems. I, I've made it this far. I've done a ton of work. Like I, I got to cut this off. So first six months were great. It's kind of like a honeymoon where I was like I was losing weight. I got I got abs. Like everything's good. I'm happy. Just a different side of me, right? Like the little kind of like boy energy that I have. You know, mm-hmm. you see me in the team. I'm always running around fucking with people and dicking yeah. around and stuff. It's I kind of got back to that and it felt good. Um, <clears throat> and then I hit the six month mark, and then I hit like this dry drunk phase where it was just again, the stuff that I hadn't deal with in the past or I hadn't processed or thought about was kind of like, it was kind of hanging over me, but I didn't know, I didn't know what it was that, you know, and I was still holding on to like a lot of the military stuff. And, uh, like in my spare time, I'm looking for like, not that I could ever do this cause I was busy, but I was looking for contracts. I was looking at gear. I was like, guys are still in, like, I was kind of like envious of them, you know, like I hadn't let go of that, that guy that was there. Cause like, I, that's, it's a very rock and roll lifestyle, mm-hmm. you know, when you're, when you're doing it. And then like, I, I always, I, I liked being that guy. You know what I mean? But then but now I'm in this position. I'm a dad. I'm at home. I'm working as a paramedic. I hadn't, I didn't transition mentally at all. So I hit that, that dry drunk phase. Um, and then, so I'm sitting there reevaluating myself. It's like, I've been through a full blown, I've been through impatience. I've been through, you know, the, the stuff we did with Jeff, you know, we're like yeah. a full blown, like sports and fitness workup got, you know, got a lot better from there. I've been through every medication on man well into double digits where I, I mean, I was following protocols. Like I, I actually wanted to get better, you know, and then I, hundreds of hours of, of therapy and I'm still have this, thing. I've gotten to a certain point, but I'm still having this angst. This still, like, I'm still pissed all the time, you know? And then I got people that are dependent on me. They don't want to be around that dude. Yeah. Um, which leads me into, so along the way, way back when, uh, I heard about people going down to Mexico and Peru for plant medicine. So I always, it, when I first heard it, I was always, I was intrigued at the beginning of it. I was just like, well, what are we doing? And I'm thinking, you know, these are just recreational shit that you're going to go down there and do. They're going to do a bunch of hallucinogenics. More, then, ju- more drugs. Yeah, more yeah. drugs. Great. Yeah, go get weird in the woods and then come back. And then, you know, it was just, you know, I, I never thought of it as like a therapy purpose, right? It was, and I didn't know much about it. <clears throat> um, so I knew, I knew 
people that have gone through and I knew one in particular that I knew his character and I knew uh, before he went and when he, after he went and it was a stark difference like gigantically stark difference he was not the same guy when he came back for for the yeah. better right very arrogant you know very ego driven person came back and he was like a like a Hindu cow man like just yeah, yeah you could, nothing could phase him very nice and sweet so I ended up I wrote into him to uh, vets as veterans exploring, exploring treatment solutions it's ran by a seal um, um, so and I I looked at other accounts and there's stuff online you can find out about these guys and stuff so I signed up for it. <clears throat> they got back to me within two months. Um, and then I remember talking to the lady that was processing me in and I gave her the whole story. Uh, and they said like, when you hit your head on that, on that, when you crashed the parachute wreck, were you still drinking? I was like, yeah. And they said, well, here's the deal. Why you're feeling the way you feel is like when you, when you drink your dopamine goes up and it kind of stays up there. And then you get tolerance because you, you keep adding to it and that, that your, your body still expecting this kind of dopamine all the time. Then you hit your head and you're healing. It's like that field goal got stuck out there. You know what I mean? It can't come back because your brain basically healed the way it's it's healed. Whether this is science or not science, or they're just like softening me up to do this, I don't know. Yeah, it made sense at the time. <laughs> so they recommended me go down for. Uh, I mean, it makes sense because you're always the people that are in that life. Yeah. and and you know, Mario's talked about it when he, you know his his when he got shot. Like you're always you're just you keep chasing it, and then it becomes never enough. Yeah. So it makes sense. You know, whether it's scientific or not, I don't know, but it does make sense because you're constantly. You get used to taking two pills, yep. and then if that doesn't do it, then you take three, and then you just keep, and then, like, you know, six-pack's not good enough. I'm going to yep. go switch to a handle, and then a handle's not good enough. Now I'm just drinking fucking all day long. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, I, it, that to me makes sense because people chase it. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, they recommend the Ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT protocol. All right, so... Um, What's that first one? Ibogaine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just a brief on Ibogaine. It's a, It comes from a shrub. It's from the Iboga plant. It comes from one part in Western Africa. And they grind up the root, and then uh, there's two ways you could do. You have the total alkaloid, which is just the ground up root stuck mm -hmm. stuff in a pill, or you could have the uh, they do um, they refine it with certain like solvents and stuff. They have like a powder that you can take that's a little more refined. It doesn't have extra stuff, and it just has the the active uh, psychedelic in it mm -hmm. in the component. So um, they used for thousands of years in Africa for psycho spiritual reasons. You know, it's kind of like how they do ayahuasca in this in in Peru, where it's yeah. you know uh, birth, death, uh, transitions in life, um, you know, having spiritual problems and stuff like that. So um, they uh, offered that, and then I picked a date, and then I was uh, I was on my way out. So um, by but, this point, you for all intents and purposes, you're doing decent. Yeah, on the outside, not in my head. Like yeah, I, I've made it right. Yeah. I, I've I've worked. I, relationship, kids, house, money, it's all there. There's just this there, there's this this like thing. nagging thing that yeah. I just can't I can't get through, and I, I'm getting tired of it. Yeah, and old thoughts are coming back, and you know, and I, and I, it made me nervous, right? Because I, I remember how I felt then; I, those things were starting to creep in. So maybe it was a good time to go. <clears throat> um, very very professional organization, right? So uh, vets raises the money, they give it to the people down in Mexico, um, and then I go, and then they schedule the flights, went down to Mexico, stayed in San, in San Diego for a night, uh, and then we get into Mexico, and it was. <clears throat> the, some of the most loving and caring people I ever met in my entire life, you know, and they, they, they know what we're about to go through, but we don't. Right. Yeah. Ibogaine is one of the harder, uh, traditional psychedelics. I mean, it's a very long, uh, you're in, you're in it for 12 to 24 hours. Um, it can be like very, it's known for having, so e each one of these have like different energies, right? So like, if you have like ayahuasca, we'll say that's the grandmother energy. And for me, in my opinion, like Ibogaine was like the drunk uncle that just got picked up from like, got out of prison. Like it's, yeah. it was just this very like, and I'll get into it. Very uh, like wild hallucinations and stuff, but it, you're uncomfortable a lot um, going into it. But uh, yeah, we got down there, a great place. Uh, everything, very respectful people. Uh, we got they ran blood work on us. Uh, we had uh, so ibogaine tends to mess with your sodium t and uh, potassium channels, so it can mm -hmm. kind of mess with your heart rate a little bit. But they do IVs and stuff, and you have a whole entire medical staff behind you while you're actually in process with this stuff. Um, so my goal going down there was. I need to figure out what this is like, why I'm feeling this way, you know? And I had an idea that it was a, uh, I was still holding on to the military stuff, you know? It's like, I, cause that's, that's what I would do the other day with my free time. Kind of like I was sitting on the couch waiting for the next damn deployment. Right, and now I'm right. looking at gear and shit, looking for contracts, the same shit. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we, uh, do all the group stuff. It, it's, it's time. It's, it's ceremony night. So we're getting ready to do it. <clears throat> and then, uh, so we go out to the fire. There's like a small little fire. You, you talk about your intentions, right? So that's what I told everybody. Like, I need, I want to be able to give up the military stuff. That's where I'm going with it tonight. Um, they give you a series of pills, <clears throat> and the one of the facilitators like to play jokes. He had like a little red pill from like the Matrix and stuff. 
Yeah. He's like, <laughs> I think he says like, you want to see how far the rabbit hole goes? Like they're oh, making shit. jokes and shit. Yeah. They give you a flood dose, right? So it's what it is. It's uh, they give you a tester, which has a very low amount to see if you're going to react to it. And then every five minutes you're taking a pill. So they just load you up and we're all kind of sitting outside. There's a pool out there and they have this room set up with mats. It's a uh, mattress on the ground. You have a heart monitor, you have a mirror or a mirror and like kind of an altar setup where there's flowers and stuff. And there's like a maraca on the ground. And they tell you when your ears start to buzz, time to go inside. Okay. So we're just coming up there and then you start kind of feeling weird and like ears started to buzz. So I went and sat down and I remember, uh, I don't really remember people coming in, but they have, uh, they play like traditional music where the, the, the stuff comes from. And it's like, it's, it's these, it's very like twangy and whiny. It's very weird listening to, especially when you're coming up on a yeah, yeah. massive hallucinogenic, massive dose of hallucinogenic, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, re- the last thing I remember was, uh, people, the people are feeling uncomfortable. So they have like the maraca in their hand. They just start banging the maraca. Cause they, I don't know if they think it's making them feel better or whatever. So I hear where, where maraca is going. Plus the wild ass music in the background. And all of a sudden, and then you have to be in an eye mask the entire time. So it's, it's very odd. If you pull your eye mask up, you can talk to the people next to you while you're like, you're in it. But as soon as that eye mask go down, you're, it's, you're kind of, you're in the Internal. process, in process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, there's a lot of, uh, auditory hallucinations. So as I was on the come up, I was here, it's like, I was in a noisy bar. There's nobody talking in there at all. Like I was like, I was, I pulled my mask up the other, like, who the fuck is talking right now? Like, this is, everyone, this is the, everyone, this is the voices in your head, yeah, man. Everyone's, everyone's weirded out and tired right now. Like, who was talking? I pull my shit up. I'm like, there's nobody here. There's nobody talking. It's all in your head. Yeah. So uh, I had my IMS down. And I, like, the Baracas were kind of all over the place. All of a sudden, they got in sync. And then the music stopped. I don't think the music stopped. And then all of a sudden, everything got quiet. And then I had this ball of light, like, right in the, right in the middle of my face. And I'm like, oh, fuck, here we go. Because, like, your brain, it's weird. Your brain's still with it. And it's like, you, you pick up this energy with it. And you can interact with it. You can ask, you can ask it questions. It'll show you things. I know that sounds like a crazy person, but you can interact with it. So, um, so yeah, I get the white ball light and then all of a sudden the scene opens up and I'm in this lime green trailer and these are movie quality hallucinations, right? Movie quality. I look outside. It's like a desert wasteland. It's kind of like it was in the middle of Africa and sand dunes or whatever like that. So I look outside and I can see my knees. I can't see anything else. It's like a camera's on the top of my head, but I can't see nose, shoulders, arms, or nothing like that. There's a door right in front of me, <clears throat> and it's got a, a glass pane, and there's a dark figure outside that door. And then to my left, there's a kitchen with a Hispanic lady, and they're cooking. I have no idea what she had to do with the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you were just hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had no idea what this lady was there for. But I look at her, she looks at me, and she smiles, and she waves. So I look at her and I smile and I wave and I was like, I was like, okay. And then, but I'm still looking at that doctor. I'm like, I, I'm to the point where like, I know what the fuck that's going to be. This is going to be bad. Like there's no other way this could turn out good. It's right. not, not going to come in there and give me cookies or something. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, she's, she, uh, takes her apron off. She closes the oven. She's like doing some preparation type stuff. And then she walks to the door and then she looks, takes one more look at me and she smiles and she kind of gives me like one of these. And then she opens the door. This dark figure comes running at me. And then the last thing I know, I go over the top of the couch and then I'm getting beat to death with this gigantic fireman's ax. Like it's just, I could see the ax coming down and I could, I could kind of feel the thud. Like I'm not in pain. I'm scared. Like I'm really scared. I'm feeling my hands. Like I feel my hands feel slippery. Like there's blood on it and I'm freaking out. Right. Cause I don't know. I don't know if it's a real death or like, you know what I mean? Like yeah, this yeah. is movie quality hallucination. I don't know if I'm really getting beat to death with an ax or not. Like I'm pulling my mask up, but it, it continues, you know, like you, you have open and closed eye visuals. So this is happening whether I like it or not. <laughs> so that happens. I'm very confused at this point. And then I get shit. I get kind of teleported to like this. Uh, the best way I could describe it was uh, if you went to like a landfill at night. Like I'm climbing okay. through like this trash. I can feel things. I'm cold. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm scared. And at this point, I start asking questions like, what, what are you trying to show me? Like, I don't, I don't get this. And this is the, the la- next 12 hours. With, this is what it was. It was like me climbing through trash. This like, is 12 hours. 12 hours straight of me in this, in this spot where I'm flashing back and forth from that scene with the ax to like be me being in this trash pile. And I'm interacting with it at the time. I'm like, what are you trying to show me? Like, I don't understand. Is this the whole time? Is this just mentally exhausting? Yeah. So <clears throat> on top of this hallucination, so Ibogaine uh, causes a thing called ataxia. So it hangs out kind of in the back of your head as, it, as it's working and it works mechanically. It's, it's, it, uh, it's kind of like a heart control alt delete for your brain. It, it cleans off all your receptors on top of like the hallucinations and stuff, but it, uh, it causes ataxia. So you, if you were to, I'm sitting, you have to be really still. If you move a little bit, you get nauseous and so you want to throw up. You can't stand up. And if you have to go to the bathroom, which is really where they'll come over and it'll give you like a finger and you grab on the finger for whatever reason you can stand up and walk and you won't throw up. If they let go of you, 
you'll just fall over and throw up all over yourself. Something that's like, yeah. Yeah. So you got massive nausea, yeah, whatever, nausea, yeah. your stomach's, your stomach's jacked up on top of like these horrific, you know, hallucinations that are happening. Um, <clears throat> so I, I started asking like, like, what are you, what are you trying to show me? Like, I, I don't understand it. And this goes back and forth for 12 hours as I'm vomiting and, and you know, throwing up and stuff. And then they start adding, I start reliving the scene. I have like, I have my ace solos on. I used to deploy with, and then it goes back. Then all of a sudden I have my dry fires on. Yeah. Mm. In the scene. Right. And then, so, and then I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there with my hands up trying to fight this guy and I can see, <clears throat> like I see, like I had like a cami tops rolled up and stuff like that. So yeah. I'm like, I'm in kit. So then I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Do you like, I don't understand what is going on. And, <clears throat> and then it just clicked all of a sudden. It was like, 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 why am I going to beat to death in this uniform all of a sudden? Like, and like my head clicked. There's just like that old dude needed to die. Mm. Is it, is it, is it, I'm like, I'm asking, it's like that we show me like the old guy needed to die. Cause that was the intention I came down there with was, you know, like I, I think I'm still holding on to it, you know, to the military stuff Yeah. as I'm getting hit. And as soon as my brain made that click, it was just like, I, I said, I was like, I get it. I was like, that old dude needed to die. And now I'm, I'm witnessing a, a, like a hallucination of a physical death of the old guy. Cause he's in kit now getting beat to death with an ax. Like, so I could say it was like, <clears throat> and, uh, Fuck. yeah. So then there was kind of like this, uh, as soon as I, I had that epiphany, it was like the camera came up and it was just me in a pool of blood laying there dead and dry fires. But I was happy. I, it was like this weight had lifted off my shoulders that I had never felt in my entire life. I had the scene of me dead sitting there in a pool of blood. And then that goes away and I lay back. I'm in the most peace and the most happy I've ever been in my entire life. It was like a, like a thousand pounds of bricks came out of my body. Just, just, in, that, just in that moment. Wow. And then there's a long, so this is probably like at the nine hour mark and there's multiple hours after that, that you're not like actively in, in the medicine, but you're, you're still under the influence of it. Yeah. Um, so, but then, but I had this like, and then I had the most peace I've ever felt in my entire life. And I went to this like four hours long of self-reflection where I was just like, a lot of people are right about me. You know, when they say like, <laughs> like it was just, it was just a, it was an internal look at me. Like I always thought like this PTSD stuff's bullshit, you know, like I said I, the same I, thing. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's not. It's not and going I think, through that. I think you and I had that conversation when we were still in talking about like, oh, they're just not cut from the right cloth and right. blah, blah, blah. And you know, if they're, if you, if you have an issue with it, you're just weak. And yeah. I can't believe I said the shit that I said. Man. No, no. It, it was like, it was that moment where I was just like, I was like, everyone was right. It's been me the whole time. Like I had this like very internal, like self-reflection, just like, yeah, everyone was right. It was just me. You know, and it was, it, it wasn't a hard pill to swallow. It was like, it was like freeing. Cause I can, I can, I can pinpoint it now. Well, cause you, and you were let go of your ego and your pride. And right. you're like, it's just, this is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was, it was the most free I felt. In, and then I can ever remember. It's like, I, I got rid of all that weight that I had. And yeah, the self-reflection was good for me. Cause I was like, I, I can, I'm looking at it as it like, I'm the one that's causing the problems. I'm the one that's pushing people away. Like it, it's, it's been me the entire time. Yeah. So I went through that whole process of, of the internal looking at myself in that last couple of hours. And it was, it was incredible. Um, you know, it, it was, I, I, it was exactly what I needed at that time. And that was the intention I went down there for. Um, so the next day, so they, they give you an IV in the morning cause you're, you're racked, you're hydrated, they hydrate you up. And they call it a gray day. So you're uh, you're down there, but you're not really doing much. And people are coming out of it, and they're trying to piece together what just happened to them. So you got the the staff that are in and out of people's rooms talking to them, seeing kind of where they're at, and make sure their head's screwed on. Is straight. it kind of like a somber day? Kind of just yeah, that? it's a somber day because some people like I I was ecstatic. I was bouncing off the walls because I just got rid of all this bullshit, and I'm happy. I want to talk. It wasn't like that for everybody. Some I people got imagine, hit with yeah. Some, yeah. Some people got hit with some stuff that they didn't know it was still in their head or didn't yeah. want to process or whatever. So yeah, it, it's uh, I think I was the only one that was out bouncing around. Cause you know, Hey, what's wrong with you guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, why aren't you guys happy right now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Everyone's pumped. Like, Fuck John, leave yeah. me alone. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, so you have a great day and then the following day they're going to, we do a uh, session with five MEO DMT. At this point I had not done much information on it, much research on it. I was just focused on Ibogaine because you have all the scary stories about how bad that, that, uh, that process is. And I'm kind of glad I didn't do it at, the, at that time. So <laughs> just worth for worth away. Five MEO is the strongest psychedelic known to man, and it's smoked, so it hits you immediately. So uh, they like to call they say different names for it. It's the crown jewel of all psychedelics. It's the, this is the icing on the cake, and they talked about it very like very kind of like it was an afterthought, not mm -hmm. like a main event, which is definitely was a main event. <clears throat> so I knew a little bit about it at the time. Five MEO uh, is uh, is the God molecule, right? People have it's the mystical and religious experience, right? People find God on it. People quit drinking. They change their lives. It's very fast. Um, <clears throat> it's only twenty to forty five minutes. Like from from the pipe to driving is like forty five minutes. You can drive. 
Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to work on was I always had a problem. I was an atheist my entire life. Like I didn't believe in nothing. My parents tried to put me in catechism when I was young. I got thrown out. <clears throat> they were also Catholic. So, <laughs> you yeah. know, that so there's always uh, its own problem inside there. I just, I never, I never grasped it. So it's never bought in, never bought into it. As far as yeah. I was concerned, when, when you die, the lights go out and that's, that's it. it. That's it. This life's pointless. We're just, I have no idea why we're here. I have no idea what we're doing here, you know? And when you're an atheist and you go through some shit, it, it's, it hurt. I feel like it hurts more, right? Cause it's, it's somebody stealing time away from you. If you, there's no thought of afterlife or relief after yeah. this life and then people screw you over, like it's personal. What is this all is? If it yeah. doesn't mean anything, then what does it mean? Right. Yeah. And you walk around angry all the time. Right. Right. Cause everything's just fucking you. Right. right. Everything's taken, everyone's taking from you mm-hmm. at this point. So, and going through the funeral process, you see people, yeah. You see, the, they see the faith. The people have faith, and you see the the, the people that sit in their house and drink all the time, and, and you're just angry, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you see them. You see when you have the death, you see these two groups go through this process, and it seemed like the ones that had faith always came out stronger, and they got in. And you see these guys that just hold on to stuff and bury it, and you can see it come out in other ways. That was me for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think, and we talked about this. Like I had faith at one point, and then I lost it because of what we did and the people right. that we lost. I was just like, this is fucking horseshit. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to this. This doesn't make any sense. And if it does, if does, something does exist, well, fuck them and their assholes. Yeah. Which, so then I landed on the fuck, the, the, <laughs> I landed on the drinking and the angry people yeah. side uh, and, and not, it not making sense. So yeah. anyways. Yeah. So yeah, I, I saw the two camps and then, uh, so I, I wanted, I wanted to believe, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I would go to church, I would read, I looked at different religions, Buddhism, you know, Catholic Christian, the whole nine. And I would get to, I, I would enjoy the lessons. I would get to a certain point, but that faith part where it's like gun to your head, you believe what you, what you're saying, which I think a lot of people struggle with that. And like, no, I don't, I think this is bullshit, you know? So, so what am I doing? I'm just, I'm, I'm following this path, but I'm not really following this path, right? right? Cause I'm not believing I can't, I can't get over that hump, Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> just from the text and stuff like that, you know, and just, I, I did not believe there was anything outside this world whatsoever. So that was my intention going in with 5 me. I was like, I, I, I want to know if there's there or not there. Like, just, just let me know. I don't care either way. You know, I just want to know so I can put this shit to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so you get in, you sit on the mat. Uh, they, ha- they have a, an eye mask there, and it comes like this little specialty pipe. It, the, uh, the size of the dose is the size of a small nail head. It's uh, 15 milligrams. It's a tiny little white dot. Um, so you uh, sit back, they heat it with a torch, you inhale. It's a, so you inhale for about 10 seconds, you hold for 10 seconds, and they lay you back. It was <sighs> the most, like, words fail to describe. The, the, this is the one that the world's failed to describe the experience. It was the most overwhelming thing I've ever felt in my entire life. It was uh, overwhelming with love, with peace, euphoria, oneness, um, to the point where I didn't, like when I came back, it, it's, it completely separates you. It puts you in what they call a non-dual state, right? So we have a dual state where you're, you're, you are reacting to the world and stuff like that. Your ego is reacting to the world like you're, you're a part of it. When you're in a non-dual state, it's kind of like your ego goes away and you're just left with just who you are as, as a person, your soul, or whatever you want to call it. So it takes, it's an ego death. It takes it all away. But there's a barrier to entry, right? So after you take this long inhale, you realize very quickly that you cannot overpower this. You are going to disappear and there's nothing you can do about it. So your ego tries to claw back, like, hey, no, I don't want to go. So there's there's this, like, if you make it through the first minute, you enter kind of this, like, promised land area where it's just, like, it's the most, like I said, the most love and the peace I've ever felt in my entire life. Is it a control life. thing? Are you trying to control that first minute? Is that what it is? So me, I was so ready to go. I was I, I let go very easily Okay. because um, I was I was ready for it. It's just a natural reaction because it's it's a feeling you've never felt before. And then you, uh, you feel your ego start to go away. It's just kind of like you're disappearing, you're dissolving yeah. and you're kind of like, it's, you've never at any point in your life, you've never been out without your ego at this point. When you, if you, when this happens, this is the only time in your life ever where your ego is going to go away and you're left with just your true self. Mm-hmm. So it's a feeling you've never felt before in your entire life. <clears throat> so sometimes your ego tries to claw back and some people will get a fear response for it. I was pretty good. I was able to breathe through it. But the experience was so overwhelming. It, uh, <clears throat> it's not like real visual. It's all like intuition. Like you just feel all this stuff. And then uh, it, right then there, I was like, there, like, there is something after this. There has to be something after it was, it was that kind of overwhelming experience. There's nothing I've ever experienced in this lifetime whatsoever. And nothing, like I said, words can't describe it. It's not like I saw a vision of God or I believe this. It was just the, the amount of energy I felt inside my body. And I was like, there... There's no way there's not an afterlife. There's no way there's not a place that we go after this place. Mm-hmm. 
you know, <clears throat> and then so um, you do two rounds with that. And then I was, it was like that bridge, that, that point that I got beforehand where I was like, this is bullshit. Like I just, I came back and after the effects went away, it was just, it was just in place. It was just yeah. like, I just believed that there was an afterlife. It wasn't like I had an epiphany or something happened other than the feeling, but it just, that, that uh, doubt was gone. It was the weirdest thing ever. So I went from like an atheist <laughs> to spiritual in 20 minutes. It was like, it's like a light switch went on and off. Right. You know what I mean? And I still carry it today. I still think about it all the time. It's still, it was still the, the, out of everything I've done in my entire life, that five MEO experience was by far the most overwhelming positive experience I've ever had in my entire life. Like to this day, jump in kids, marriage, you name it times a thousand. It was the, it was wow. the biggest moment I ever had in my entire life. So, um, but that gave you the, like the, the kind of talking to you last night, it seems like it just unshackled you from a bunch of weight. Yeah across the board for your whole life no yeah, all of it did so yeah letting go in the military for the day before with ibogaine and then the biggest lesson i had was a 5meo because it, it's carried over more than anything else right because like the complaints that people have to me like you're, you're a good dude but you're like you're, you get negative a lot of the time you know what i mean and then i i'm not a negative person anymore you know yeah. I, I can i i can i can see through things and i, I understand things i can process things a lot better because i know this is not just this is it for us yeah you know what i mean like that that was the biggest gift it was just saying that like you know there there is something else out there you're not here all alone and i'm not like an actor in somebody else's movie right like it gives you this idea that you are you are self-containing you are god you are the master of your own of your own life <clears throat> you know like you, you everything that you have to fix yourself and to be happy is all contained inside you you don't need external stuff you know, and it kind of shows you that when you're inside that thing. So it, it, it gives you all those gifts. And then as you progress on, you know, it's, it's, it's having a spiritual awakening like that. There is challenges, right? Cause you after I had to relearn everything, like yeah. how I interact, how I thought of things, how I thought of relationships, stuff I was doing that was self like fulfilling that I had to cut off. There's people in my life I had to get rid of, you know, like it's just, it, it, it completely changes everything, you know, after that. So, um, and it's still stayed to this day. Like I, I haven't how I feel about faith and the afterlife and stuff like that has not changed. And we're at a uh, January would be one year. Wow. So, um, yeah, it, it's been by far the most beneficial thing I've ever done. You were talking about, um, cause I was sharing my experience last year. Um, my first experience last year, but, and you were talking about how, uh, can you speak to a little bit about doing the work on yourself pre versus going in in, in kind of a negative space? Because, like, you you and I both have done a ton of interpersonal work yeah. leading up to this. Um, so the differences between that and versus somebody that's, like, I'm all fucked up. Like, maybe, <clears throat> yeah, I don't you like, you, you know, John in New Hampshire going straight there and doing that versus you doing it when you did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, just to clarify, everything I talk about today is my own experience and my own alone. Yeah, <laughs> not, right. So yeah. some people, I, I, I hate to send me see this, like this big transformation thing and then go do it. And then they don't have the same outcome. Like it's different for everybody. And then yeah, to caveat on, on that, like everyone's brain chemistry is differently. So it, different. It's always going to work differently for different people, but I had great relief from it. But yeah, like you're saying, going in, you don't, and then the, the people that the, the nonprofits that send you down there, they screen for this kind of stuff anyways. Then, then they know very well. But you, you you need to be in a decent place. You can't be in a crisis mode. You can't be, be in active addiction. You can't because you're just going to go back to it, right? Yeah. Um, Ibogaine is different with the opioid because it has an opioid interruption uh, part to it. So you can with that one. But all the other ones, for the most part, you don't. You can't be in active addiction. And when I went down there, I was also a year sober. You know what I mean? So you have to be in a certain place where you, you've, you've worked your way back, but you, you haven't got over that ledge. At least well, for me, that's... Well, well, my thought is, is like, if I want to get the max benefits of this experience, right? Yeah. Well, then I need to be in the best possible place that I can be so I can gain from it. Right. Versus wasting it, I guess is the yeah. word. So yeah, best, yeah, the best possible place you have. And you need, you need a soft landing area too. Yeah. So a lot of these people will have to do work on themselves. They come back to, you know, they, they're on the outs with their, with their significant other or they're in severe debt or they're going under or something like that. You can't go back to that because in these things will show you stuff that they, by no means are these a silver bullet, right? So you're going to get these lessons. That you just have to do work. Yeah, you're going to yeah. get a feeling. You're, you're going to get these intuition, these feelings, and you're going to get these lessons. And you'll get a little bit of a honeymoon with it where you get these good vibes coming out of it. But if you don't incorporate or change anything in your life, you're just you're going to go back to where you were before. Yeah. So it just gives you this window of this gap and it shows you exactly what you need to work on. And then if, as long as you work on it, you'll, you'll be okay. But if you come back to a home that's 
not conducive in to that. Turmoil. In turmoil. In yeah. turmoil. Like it's just gonna be it's gonna be a wasted trip. So yeah, that would be my recommendation as John. Like, yeah, make sure soft landing area, you gotta you need to be stable. You know, I mean but uh I think that that'd be a, the recipe. And then you have to be ready for it, right? So you have to be ready to change. These these are gigantically strong psych these are strong psychedelics done to man and they're giving you they're pushing you to the, the maxis doses and they're putting you in a therapy setting and they're they're gonna make you go as deep as possible to get to the, the max benefit. And that's hard work. Man. It's very and it's extremely hard work. None of this <clears throat> was was fun by any means. You know, it's it, they'll drag you to the deepest part of hell and the highest part of heaven. And they can do that all in three seconds, five minutes. You never know. It's up and down the entire time. So um, it, it's, it is a lot of work. Um, and it is, it, I mean, it's on the more extreme spectrum for therapy and stuff. You know, I, I think, I think it's, there's something to be said about going through the medication process, the counseling process, and like working for the stuff that's, that's available before you do something like this, right? Because yeah. for me, I think if I opted to do it right off the bat, I don't know if it had the same effect to it, right? Because it, it would just, by that time, I had run out of options and I just was, I was, trying to, I was preparing myself. I'm just going to be an angry dude for the rest of my life. I remember that. I was exact, wrapping, wrapping my head around this. I and remember then this that option, exact feeling. Yeah. And then this option came up and like, and then I was just like, I hope this works because I don't want to be this person. Yeah. And then I went down and I had the experience I did, you know, and I've taken lots of hits since I came back and, you know, I still have bad days, <clears throat> you know, but I'm still sober. I don't take any medication. Um, you know, yeah. You were mentioning last night that if you hadn't done this, like you have a different set of tools now. Yeah. So like when, when hits do happen in life, it's not quite the same as it was, you know, right. several years ago. Yeah. It's in yeah, having, having a faith based, you know, spiritual understanding where it's like you take these hits, but then you can look further down the road where it's like, maybe I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, or maybe I'm getting reset for something better. You know, yeah. that wasn't the case in my head before it was, it was a straight up attack and I'm pissed and I'm going to fight everybody on the way down. Like, I can't believe this is happening to me versus like, okay, well this happened for a reason. Let's move on. Let's go on and do something else. That's where my head's at. It doesn't mean I don't get mad. I don't get pissed, but like I have a processing capability. Maybe, maybe I'm not living concurrently with where I'm supposed to be. Well, yeah. Maybe yeah. this isn't for me. Maybe this is the universe resetting me to do something better, you yeah. know? And that, that's kind of where I usually go for it, which is a very different thing from anyone that's known me. So yeah. shit, man. Um, So we've obviously been friends for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I guess I guess you could say we have some a checkered past or a checkered incident. Yeah. Um, and I've never I've never publicly talked about this. Um, and it's something that's like it, that weighed on me for a long time, obviously. Um, and it's shitty. Um, in 2009, we were patrolling in Afghanistan and... Um, that shitty deployment that you, that you brought up. <laughs> and we're doing a shitty patrol that neither of us can remember a reason why, why we were doing it. Just walking out in the middle of daylight. <laughs> Moving to contact, <laughs> Moving right? <to> contact. <laughs> Moving to contact with 12 dudes, right? Uh, it wasn't even 12 dudes. I don't even know how many. There's just a handful of yeah, us. Yeah. yeah. And, um, anyways, we're patrolling in this, in this village and, uh, you, you were ahead of me and, um, I didn't, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know what was going on, but we were walking across this, that fucking Afghan stucco wall, mm -hmm. and there was doors going into compounds, um, not to buildings, but to like the um, compound. Yeah, like, the outskirts. The oh, outskirts, yeah. yeah. And uh, as I walked past the very last one, I remember it was the very last one, because that was the end of the building, end of the wall on the other side, fucking dog jumped out, uh, started coming at me. So I turned and I uh, drilled this dog and um, about four times and uh, biggest fucking dog I've ever seen. And um, unfortunately, one went through um, ricocheted and hit you. Yep. Yeah. 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 I remember that we uh, were approaching it and I think I was on the door and I... I heard there's a dog on the other side. I don't know yeah. if I pass it on or you're further behind me, but I'm like, and this is a support guy. So I got, I got uh Tosca on leash. So like, the last, oh, thing, I, right. the last thing I need, yeah, the last thing I need is a big Afghan Kushi dog. That's probably about 190 pounds. The dog fight that, you know, it's, it'd be impossible. So I remember like opting, like there's a dog here. I'm gonna go along. I pulled that far side security. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, either opening the door or we had to go in that compound for some reason. I don't yeah. know if we had some hot Intel, 
on it. <laughs> so that's sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> Some hot intel yeah. on that building. But uh, yeah, we're supposed to go into it. And then, man, that, that dog, I remember looking on my shoulder. He, he was all about 180 pounds. Yeah. Just came firing at you. And then, yeah, you just, you're, remember, you, you're hitting him with the barrel because you were too close and you were shooting at the same time and then trying to get some distance from you. And I looked over my shoulder. And then, yeah, just that ricochet came back and hit me in the back of the leg. Yeah, um, yeah went to the leg. And then I forget what happened after that. Yeah, it, the dog came up. I remember one guy stuck his finger in my leg. Like what had not, not even a medic. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sorry, I'm not gonna yeah. say his name, but he walks out there, he rips my pants open. He goes, Yeah, there's a hole in your leg. And I get, I'm looking at him, he's got dip all over his face. He's got he's got his gloves on, but he has his middle finger is that has no no padding on it, right? He has dip all over his finger. He sticks his f- finger right in my leg with his middle finger. He goes, Oh yeah, man, that might be a bullet hole. I'm like, well, they're gonna have to amputate my damn leg now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh man, dude, but, that was so shitty, man. But uh, it was shitty. Yeah, and the, we get we. I walked just just for context, right? It, it was a it was a piece of jacket of the round that went into my leg. Yes, it came off a rock. It was hot and it burned. I walked back to the truck. I was retained in country. I was on pay meds for two days. I hung out for two weeks and I was back to work. It wasn't it wasn't what people painted it to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? That I think that was the biggest thing. They made it out to be that there was this it was a blue on blue, which wasn't the case at all. Like I think anyone put in that position would it react they damn sure would have reacted the same way with that gigantic dog coming out of them. You know what I mean? And then the, the chances like of catching a ricochet in close quarters working with a special operations team, that 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 shit happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not it's still it's it does happen, but it's still not great feeling when right. or one of your ricochets yeah. hit your friend. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. And, uh, and what's really bad is no one, there's a literally a handful of people that were there. Right. Literally no one knows that story. No. And although, and, and what's what's told about that story is that I indeed, I shot somebody on my team. Right. And, and none of those, it's just nobody that tells that story right. or the handful of people that try to like smear my name or do right. whatever knows what really happened yeah and in all honesty that happened between you and me mm-hmm. at no time was i i watched the entire thing happen right at no time was i ever mad at you did we ever fracture our friendship like i i, I was fucking still shitty for me though yeah you know I, i'm sure it was shitty and then everything all the backlash and everything that happened after that dude but I, I never i never held anything against you i watched the entire thing happen and you know when you things like that happen you got to put yourself in that person's shoes yeah and it, it was just, it was a very series of unfortunate events. You know, there it was no animosity whatsoever no, there with that been. towards you and me. It was, it was all the other external stuff that, you know, it's in it and, and not to like <clears throat> throw stones or whatever. Cause it had, whatever happened, it happened, it happened the way it happened. Um, still shitty regardless of, regardless of the, of what people say, that's the real story. And it, even the real story is shitty yeah. cause you would never want that to happen. If the roles reverse, you wouldn't, nobody yeah. would want that to happen. Um, what really always grind, not to make it funny, but what always really grind my gears, all the people that, that wasn't there that made shit up or, you know, took the story and twisted it. Like it was just, it was one of the, one of the worst days of my life. You want, you want to talk about it some more? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Um, yeah, man. I was there and yeah, we're still friends. So and have been it just yeah, everybody else seemed to want to put their two cents in and make it way, a lot worse than what it was, which yeah. they were again. Nobody, nobody was there. Right. Anyways, um, yeah, it was a shitty thing. And then, uh, and then, of course, I, I'm the guy that has to call the cops on you. <laughs> right. Yeah, we've had, a, we've had a weird relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. Um, and and then one of the reasons why, and, and kind of weird speaking on that, right? And uh, you know, kind of talking about, we were kind of talking about our spiritual journeys of becoming. Yeah, I guess finding spiritually spirituality again for me, and then kind of like coming back to that faith um, after I had lost it for a long time because of stuff that had happened. Yeah, and um, now I truly believe that like you know when you're when you're tuned in and things are things start to happen, like they happen for a reason, yeah. especially when you're doing the work. And uh, so recently something happened. We a, a clip went viral. A guy tried to like again talk. He brought up something, and I I called you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, just so you know, the bullshit's going around again. You know what I mean? Like, I just want to give you a heads up. And you're like, hey, dude, funny you called. 
because <laughs> life kind of went took a took a right a hard a hard left turn recently. I'm like, yeah. really, what's going on? And we don't have to get into it, but yeah. but I was like, if that wouldn't happen, I probably wouldn't have checked on you. No, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not that we're not like friends, like we're friends, but we don't need to communicate every day. Right, we're on the same stage. You know? But like if that. I need you, yeah, I know it's a phone call away, and the same go, you know, the same goes. So, um. It was a fucking, like, I'm actually very thankful that that happened because it gave me the opportunity to, like, the, that was the universe going, hey, go check on your friend. Yeah. And then we get to, now we get to hang out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that that wouldn't have happened. No. You, you or know? You, or yeah, or you're not looking for it. You wouldn't have recognized it, right? Right. That was for me. Like, I, I would take things for granted. And, like, this is now, like, like more on the spiritual side, like I look for things like that, like these little warnings, these little flashes and stuff that, you know, like there's and, a reason why this happens, you know, it's, and, it's cool to see. Right. And on that, on that exact note, it's some of the worst shit that's happened to me in my life or your life. I look back years later. Right. And I'm like, Oh fuck. If that wouldn't have happened, then this other thing wouldn't have yeah. happened that I'm super thankful for. You know, the opportunities, the lessons, the, uh, you know, everything that came for it, all the, horrific shit like if, if i didn't get fired from my i, I call it fired but uh, if they didn't cancel my contract on my first contracting yeah. job i would never have started my own business yeah i mean i was my first year out of the marine corps i was making one hundred sixty eight thousand dollars. if i a year i did if i, I wouldn't just th- like i'm not gonna be like ah, i'm gonna throw one hundred sixty eight thousand dollars away yeah. and then go start my own business and go work for free for i don't know four years or however long it <laughs> fucking took. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I wouldn't have done it, but now I've completely built a life for myself and given, you know, the ability to have other people build a life for themselves, yeah. which never would have happened without a really bad day. Yeah. I look back on it too, that the parachute crash as terrible as it was where I'm at today. Like I, I would have continued down that rabbit hole. And then what it, would have happened? It would have probably blown my brains out. You know, I, I'm 100 percent positive that been one of our statistics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, one of the statistics of just you know going down there. So I still would have kept the all the substance abuse problems. I probably would have got enough good enough to get on a deployment, and then I would have lost my family. Daughter would have been gone, and I would have went three letter agency, and then I'd just be sitting in a, in a dark room one by night, myself, drinking yeah, heavily. Like, all they did was just work and push everyone out of my life. So I, I still think back on that as bad as it was, and as as, as hard as the growing pains were. Yeah, I, I, that was a catalyst for but, growth. But my yeah, my brain was not going to quit. I was continuing <laughs> yeah. on the path, and then right. I was at, like the universe had to physically break me in half to get right. me to stop and to change my my direction on where I was going. You know, you, you look back on these these points in your life, or like I have no idea how I'm still here. You know what I mean? Like I, I I have skipped out on helicopter crashes. I've had people get shot right next to me. Like you know, all you look all these little things. Like there's statistically there's I, I don't see the reason why I'm still here. You know what I mean? And which it was struggled with that before because I, I you look at the helicopter crash and like there's a reason why I'm still here and I'm happy I'm how, still here. How easy how like one little turn of fate you could have been on that. Yeah. You could have been on that bird. Yeah, easy day. Yeah. Um so it's cool to see. I, I'm 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 hopeful for the future. I, I know the best is yet to come for me and stuff like that. You know, it's just taking a while. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like that. But yeah, I, I have the same thing. Like looking back on that crash now with some, you know, stuff in the rear view mirror and, and some, a few, a lot of tomorrows in between that, like that, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Cause my no. quality, I wouldn't, I don't you think you would never, like if I walked into your hospital room and you were out of it and said, John, <laughs> don't worry. This is the best thing that ever happened to you. You'd be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, but it's, it's true, man. I look at every hardship that I've ever faced and it's either. You have a choice, man. You you can utilize it for what it is. You can and and then learn to grow from it um, and use it as a catalyst, or let it end you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh yeah. You have to persevere. It's you got to keep some faith because you're not going to be able to see the outcome of it. You know what I mean? You have to. Which is, I think, that's kind of the like that's where you know. Obviously, you and I have gotten like have gotten a. A lot older than we anticipated. Yeah, um, that was another thing too. I never expected to be this old either. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that last night, right? There's yeah. like, they're like, well, I'm not gonna make it out of here, yeah. so yeah, <laughs> might as well was, fucking you're turn. In the, you're in the meat turn, grinder, like, yeah, was, might as well turn it up to eleven. Yeah, well, you thought about investing, like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> now I wish I would have worried about your future, like, yeah. no, 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 it's it's, it's gonna what be future. Yeah, I keep. Uh, yeah, it is a mindset too. I had going through the deployment cycles. It was just like I, you roll the dice enough, 
Something's going right. to happen. You keep going, regardless of what happens. You roll it enough, it's going to it's going to happen. That's I didn't. I took every deployment as as a deployment. I didn't. There was no looking forward after that. It was just like I got to do this, get through. It. Like, up, oh, I made it. Now I got to get my shit together in real life, and then go on to the next one. That's exactly what was my mentality. So. And I look back now, and I'm like, damn, dude, if I would have invested in X, Y, and Z, or like put yeah. money on this way, it would that you know, it was in my fucking twenties, bro. You know, imagine what you could do plus what yeah. the stock market was and. If I you knew know. what I knew about money now than I knew then, I'd be in a lot better place. Yeah, it's, right. It's, but it, those, I, are, those are how lessons are for me. It's like I, I learn the lesson <laughs> on the back end after I've made a shit ton of mistakes and got all the best advice possible. Yeah, then I'm in that position and like, but I won't do it again. Yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and that was the exact same for me. I was just living deployment by deployment. Um, before we wrap up, I do want to bring up one one thing because it's it still fucking pisses me off to this day. Um, maybe I have not let this one go. <laughs> Um, so we were up in, uh, up in Northern Afghanistan. Um, we did a deployment. It was a great deployment. We did great work. Um, it was just, it was like what we were talking about riding around on motorcycles in Afghanistan yeah. with, with a surrogate army and riding off the back of helicopters. And, you know, we got into some pretty serious, you know, gunfights and, and did a lot of good work. Um, and, uh, while we were there, while we were there, um, State Department came in. I don't know if, you remember, you remember if I ever told you this. Okay. Um, State Department came in and said, and asked the team, said, tell us why this location is, um, what do you, how do you word it? Crucial to um, national security. A BMG base? Yeah. yeah. And I was like, this motherfucker. <laughs> I'm like, you're the State Department, bro. Yeah. Like, you sent us here. Like, that's the way this works. You guys do foreign policy, and then we are the action arm to go make things happen in in the world. Yeah. So why are you you asking us why we're here, dumb fuck? And and then after that, your team replaced us. Yeah. But you had a pipe-hitting team. Yeah. You guys had a pipe-hitting team, and um, they shut the program down. Yeah. But left you there. Yeah, they left us there. Uh, we dwindled down. Um, <clears throat> the new guy on the team, so obviously I rogered up to to stay later, not thinking what it what it was going to be. But uh, yeah, we uh, we shut the base down. Um, I don't I don't know why. Man, if I was in charge, of leaving two people there to watch the entire base alone and unafraid, all the way in BMG, when the closest team is in Herat. Well, well, and my 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 point of this is like it was safe when we were there. It was safe. Yeah, because we had an army. They had were armed. They were you know. Essentially, we were paying them. Right. So, like, their loyalty was, for the most part, to us. Yeah. Um, and they just said, no, we're going to shut it down, take all the arms back, stop paying yeah. them. Yeah, the, the wind shifted. Uh, once once the everyone on the outside of that gate got word that we were pulling out, then then it was they didn't care anymore. They weren't The police weren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They right. turned back into mayhem, right? Because you yeah. don't have Uncle Sugar's not going to be there to solve everyone's problems anymore. Right. So now, <laughs> <Uncle Sugar. laughs> so now they're going to start looking internal. And then, you know, so <clears throat> you had to shut the base down. But, like... It, it really put us in a, in a very crappy position for the entire community out there to know the fact that we're pulling out. They see trucks leaving, they see our boxes leaving, and they retain two to three people there. Like I was telling you, like I was on my my rifle was gone. I had a radio, I had an AK, and I had three mags. That was it. That's how we had we and we were there waiting on a, a helicopter out for the last uh, some some radios and stuff like that. Yeah. So we sat there for three days, and we had like I, I was telling you outside, we were we were, t- we were cutting out cardboard cutouts to put in the towers to look like there's people up there. Like, who made this decision? Like, as far as like a leadership goes, like how do you leave a few people up there with a village of like multiple thousands of people? So essentially, it's you know? a death sentence. Yeah, it's a death sentence. So yeah, we were on AKs and no weapons on a radio. Yeah. Um, yeah, waiting for waiting for extract. So it ended up costing us. Yeah. If we were kept our mouth shut and we just pulled out of there, you know, then that's one thing. But like everyone in that town knew that we were leaving. And then as soon as they knew we were leaving, then we started taking rounds at the front gate again. Yeah. You know, there's there everyone's pissed. And and that was that was my uh, coming back from that after that deployment. I was like, and that was my last one. I I think I'd gotten out um shortly after that and you guys were there. And um I was I'm still fucking pissed about that. Man. Yeah. And that was just, it's just, it's just, it's a bad call. And, um, you know, you should never, and even in this, even in business now, I always look at it and I actually learned this from my wife is you never put policy over people. Yeah. Ever. There's people over policy every single time. So if you're like in a business and it's like, well, yeah, we have this policy, but if you're a customer, you're a human being, you're people, I'm not going to put policy over the person. Right. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're a customer and you're a human being. 
it's the same thing. If you're serving, don't ever put policy over a human being. Right. Because essentially it's going to cost, it could cost somebody's life. Yeah. You know, which it did. So anyways, so, but you went on, had a really good deployment after that. Yeah. And yeah, uh, everything went good after that. Yeah. That was the end of it. We went back, back home and reset and all that kind of stuff. So if you're a young officer out there, there's your lesson <laughs> from two less disgruntled enlisted special operators. Um, you know, take care of your people and never put, never put policy over your people. I, mean, I think that's a piece of good, good advice for yeah. a, a young, a young officer that's going to lead sometime. Right. Yeah. Policy over people. Yeah. yeah. You invest in the humans, not the, not the policy. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Hey, listen, if, uh, dude, it's been a fucking pleasure, man. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. All these years has been a pleasure. Um, the continued conversations of growth, the continued conversations of, you know, you know, becoming better men, improving our lives is always, is always appreciated. Um, what you're doing now with everything, with the different therapies and stuff, yeah. which I've, you know, participated at, at a lower level. And, um, I, I think I was, I think I told you, like, I was really initially, like really honestly scared of yeah. it, of, of any sort of plant medicine totally different than what i yeah <laughs> than what i thought yeah our brains try to make up like how this is gonna go and then you get into it like this is nothing like i thought it was gonna nothing be. <laughs> nothing and honestly it's one of the the biggest i want to say like like you said a biggest weight off your shoulders that you've ever experienced yeah oh uh, yeah uh, bar none like like it shows you things little things about yourself that you, you're you it it's hard to unpack on a normal day to day. Right. And then like with me, it really, really unpacked some things that I had going on that I was able to like whew, breathe. Yeah. You know, and, uh, something definitely that I'll continue. And honestly, it probably was one of the things that helped me kind of go back into this, bring back spiritual and this faith component that yeah. I was, that I had lost. At least be open to it. Yeah. Yeah. That to open, to explore it, open to it, you know, dive in and, and and i've had some really beautiful conversations since then about faith and about spirituality due to that yeah and i've a lot of you know a lot of guys that um that i talk to or you know i'm friends with um have experienced the same thing like high level people yeah high level people that are like super successful and go dude when i did this that's when my ego fell off yeah that's when i was open to the world that's when success started happening because I was basically holding on to the vine and, and being my own, yeah. I don't know, worst enemy, essentially. So you're getting out of your own way. You're just using a something that had a, you're just using a substance to get help you get out of your own way. Yeah. Your ego is the problem, you know? Yeah. So when we get older, you know, there's something to be said about pushing that thing away. Especially and, guys from our community, right? Like yeah. we think that we're supposed to we're be We're all this, high ego. Yeah. yeah so all like high we're supposed ego. to be this type of dude. Yeah. This like, I can't do this. I can't do that because I'm supposed to be this. Right. What the, like, what the fuck does that even mean anymore? Yeah. And when you you take you use some of these these medicines, we'll call them, and you push that ego out of the way, you get to know who you, you get to kind of figure out who you really, who are, really are. Who you were as like a kid, who yeah. you were before all these problems and stuff like this. It's like once you figure out who your true self is, you realize how pro, how much of a problem that ego is. It, good, it, it shoots, it, sh, it shows you your holes and your gaps and what your resentments and what you're holding on to, and then then it's up to you to work on it. You know, that's a really really good point. Like yeah. your true self. How many people are the really acting their true self? Right. And not it's a, some facade of what they want people to see. Right. I mean, our, our egos are, we're not running from lions and tigers anymore, you know? So our egos kind of take a back seat to, you know, they're, they're more, they can be more of a problem these days, right? Cause yeah. they, they're, it's there to keep us alive. It's there to, it's how we present the world. It's how we make more people in this world. It's how we meet mm -hmm. people. You know, it, it's, it's there, but we're a little more technologically advanced these days. You know what I mean? So it can, it can be an app. It can, be a huge problem, right? Because you're not relying on it as much. And yeah, like I said, you, you use some of these medicines, you push it out of the way, you see exactly where your problems are at. What would you say to somebody that's like open to entertaining this? Like, what? How, what's the what's the process? Um, so do do your research. Uh, stay off YouTube. Uh, <laughs> so just I mean, you're gonna you're gonna go to YouTube anyways because I'm a curious guy and I did this I did the same thing and watched all the YouTube videos and stuff. 
Um, if you're a veteran, you look at uh, different, uh, there's different organizations out there. So uh, Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions is a great one. I've taken a trip from Heroic Hearts Project for Ayahuasca in Peru. They're, they're a phenomenal organization. Um, and then when you go on the website, there is a ton of information on this. Uh, and Vets uh, even has a, like a, a training course where you, you they, they teach you stuff, you take a test and everything on the different uh, medicines that they use. Uh, there's a ton of information out there uh, as far as, and then they've been they have doctors attached to all these people and they're running data on all these veterans going through. So then they publish all that data. So I would start there with the two websites, right? Uh, Heroic Hearts is open up to all service members. Vets is, I think it's just open to SOCOM people, but I could be, it could be wrong. I don't know if they've opened up, but um, I would start there. Uh, and then once you kind of figure out which way you want to go with it, which medicine you want to go, then go into, you know, more of your NIH type liter- uh, literature and start reading that, the case studies on it before you get into the YouTube videos where you see people either having these miraculous breakthroughs or these freak outs or whatever like that, you know, get a good basis on it. Um, and then uh, if you use these organizations too, you're gonna, I, I would recommend highly against doing it yourself. Cause that's what we're seeing now. Cause people don't want to wait the six months. People don't want to leave the country. Um, so they, they opt to just go I, from my personal experience. I would say, do not make sure you're in. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, guys don't want to do this waiting period and they'll get their, they'll get their hands on whatever they want to do. A lot of times they won't weigh it. They'll take it. And then they have this, like these horrible stories, you yeah. know, and nothing gets accomplished. Right. So these people know what they're doing. Right. So when this stuff got, you know, uh, scheduled in the seventies, you know, it doesn't mean this, this research stopped. They, everyone just went underground and the yeah. same people that were doing the seventies, the same people are doing it now. They have the knowledge to do this. And the same people are doing the seventies, the ones that are attached to these places, sending veterans. And the reality is it. it's been doing, it's been done in a certain way for thousands, thousands of years. Of years right. Yeah. And these, and they, these, these guys are like torch carriers that, that were doing the seventies and now are helping the veterans out to do it. Um, and then, you know, it's the, the, you have all your counseling, se- they screen you, you have your counseling sessions before it set your intentions. You go down you do your ceremony. You have three sessions afterwards, all the aftercare is there, you know? So try not to be impatient. What about I, I, first responders? You know first I mean, responders but- is a tough one. Um, don't quote me on this, but I think heroic path to light, they, they accept first responders, but that there is a gap there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm ideally I'm trying to get out of, out of the job I'm doing now. And I like to get into, uh, I'm taking a course called be, uh, being true to you. So it's a psychedelic integration therapist, uh, coaching course. And also, uh, goes on to, uh, substance abuse as well. And then hopefully what my plan is, is I, uh, hopefully get in with one of these nonprofits and stuff like this, but, uh, or, or work with one of them. But one of the gap major gaps they have is, uh, law enforcement firefighters. There's really not a lot of resources out there for them. Yeah. Uh, veterans are covered. There's, I can name six off the top of my head right now that they could actually apply to and then possibly get a trip and they take care of them. Not a lot of resources for uh, veterans and firefighters. I'm working with a buddy right now. He's going to go take the same course and we're going to throw around some ideas to see maybe if we can get in with somebody to kind of raise some money for, for law enforcement. Cause I, I feel like getting in with the veterans, it's already, it's already, they're already doing a great job with it. Yeah. Cops and firefighters need it as well. And, I agree. You know, um, I mean, it, it's different when you go over to combat and you deal with your combat and then you come back and you deal with your own shit. When you're a cop, you, you're there every day. You live it every single day. There's no off. There's no off gas time. They're yeah, struggling. Right. They're struggling. Right, Mario. Else. <laughs> I've always felt that way too. Is like I feel like our wars, our war was over there. Right. I mean, these guys like they just drive home. <laughs> yeah, they just drive home. Yeah, 45 minutes. And if you're yeah, unlucky and you work in the same town that you did, you you know that you live in, yeah, and then you yeah. yeah yeah it never ends for those guys. So and they, they need to just but like I said, that's trauma's trauma. No matter where it comes from. Thank you for saying that. Trauma is trauma. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be from, you know. Combat or a car accident. Combat or car accident yeah. or like childhood or whatever like that. Trauma, it stays in your body. It stays there and it lives there until you have to process it. And a lot of so people f- don't know that it's still there. And when you do these sorts of things, you, you, you can. And that's the biggest thing, right? It's like when we have trauma and we don't process it, it shows up in other ways. And that's right. the reason why we, we constantly self-sabotage and we can never get ahead in life right. because it's we always are constantly hitting this roadblock right. because of that. Yeah. And if you knew what the problem is, you probably fix it. But when you get that far down the rabbit hole, you don't know why you're feeling the way you feel. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just know you, you feel a certain way and it's a react, you're reacting to it in your public life. And then, uh, yeah, like these, these ceremonies and these medicines have a way of like drilling through all of your bullshit and going right down to the main problem and showing to you what your problem is. And then it gives you the opportunity to work on it and fix it. And it, sometimes it can help you out with that as well. Yeah. You know, so it's uh it was an absolute life changing thing for me. The best thing I ever did. Um, I can just speak from my experience. Right. Um, so anyone ever wants to talk to me about it, you can get me on Instagram at John J O N dot Stevens eight two three one. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about it. Um if you're looking for a safe ceremony space inside the US, I can also help you with that. But uh, if you have any questions, I love talking about it. I'm I'm uh, more than willing if anyone wants to talk about it because it 
great benefits for me. So excellent. Well, dude, thanks for uh, finally coming down and coming on. We've, <laughs> this has been been in in the works for a long time, and uh, it worked out the way that it needed to work out, man. And um, and we're gonna have a good week. So, yeah. um, guys, in all seriousness, um, there's probably a lot to unpack in this podcast. Yeah. So, um, listen again, share it with a friend, and uh, and like John said, if you if you are genuinely interested interested in that hit them up and uh, ask questions right don't be don't be the guy that's like you know putting up walls and thinking that you know it's, it's got to be one way i mean the reality is that with everything that's going on with ssris and pain meds and substance abuse you know just be open to have the conversation you know don't be like me you know 10 years ago where it was either, i don't know i just it was i was an idiot <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like most people in their twenties and early thirties. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've just like, you know what? There's a bigger world out there. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot more to life and there's a bigger world out there. Um, and a lot of it has to do with love and compassion. Yeah. There's a lot of beauty out there. You just have to be looking for it. Right. Yeah. Anyways, thank you guys. Um, if you feel inclined to share this, uh, give it a thumbs up, drop us a comment. Um, if you do tag Don, tag me, tag the always forward podcast. And, uh, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, so thank you guys for for listening or and watching, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.